Welcome to Couch Potato Theater here on the Fandom Podcast Network. And on Couch Potato Theater, we celebrate our favorite movies. My name is Kevin. I'm going to be your host, and we've got a special one for you tonight. We are celebrating the 35th anniversary of Roadhouse, 1989. And uh, yeah, we're going to touch on the remake a little bit too, of course, so stay around for that. But we've got a special guest, uh, also someone who co-starred in the film. And uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but uh, I did want to let you guys know because it's in, you know, it's one of those '80s films, and uh, it's R-rated. There might be some adult content and language uh, during this uh, this podcast here, so uh, just a little warning. And if you are watching us on YouTube, feel free to uh, leave a comment there. We'll uh, we'll post them, and uh, love to hear what you guys have to say. If you're listening to this podcast, make sure you also check out the YouTube video because we got some fun slides for you guys. But first, let me go ahead and introduce my crew. With me, as always, is the co-founder of the Fandom Podcast Network. That is Mr. Kyle Wagner. What's going on, brother? Well, Miho, I have got my medical <laughs> records with me. I am ready for this very fun and very special show of Couch Potato Theater we've got tonight. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. All right. And with me is my co-host of Bloody Kings, a Highlander podcast, stuntman extraordinaire, actor as well. Let's welcome Mr. Lee Felixness. What's going on, brother? Lee, can you hear us? All right, Lee. Can't hear you. Any, any connection issue there? Not much. Just enjoying this Easter Sunday here. And uh, oh. yeah, can you hear me? There, yeah, there you are. Hello? There's a little bit of a delay. So how you doing, brother? You doing all right? Uh-oh. All right. Looks oh. like we might have a little bit of Am connection problem. Lee, I'm going to take... Yeah, I can hear you, but there is a delay. So uh, do me a favor. Go ahead and uh, just... Okay. Uh, I'm going to put you in the green room. Go okay. ahead and recap. Yeah. All right, we'll get him in there real quick. All right, next with me is my co-host of Time Warp 1984 and 83 and 81 and all the other ones here on the Fandom Podcast Network, the queen of movie food, Lacey Adderhold. Welcome, Lacey. How are you? Hello, hello. I'm well. How are you guys? Doing good, doing good. Uh, you a little excited? Do you know what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be fun. I've, I've done a full, like, triple feature over the last two days, so I am ready. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, let's see, uh, Lee, let's see if you're back here. Lee, are you with us? Nope, still checking stuff out. All right, we'll, we'll figure that out. All right, now, <laughs> uh, I told you we had a very special guest, and uh, I'm really excited about this. I reached out to him, and uh, I would like to welcome you to the stage here, Mr. Anthony Delonges. How are you, sir? I'm uh, very well, thank you. Now, nice for those of you that don't know you, <laughs> uh, they're just not they paying will. attention. <laughs> yeah, they're not paying attention. But I did want to bring this to the stage here real quick, Anthony. Of course, uh, you are uh, one of the co-stars of Roadhouse. You played uh, Ben Gazzara's Brad Wesley's henchman, Gary Ketchum, a.k.a. the Bigfoot driver, or otherwise known as Right Boot, razor blade guy. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, this is exciting. I'm glad to have you on here. And uh, I want to, first of all, showcase a few other things that people may uh, remember you from. First of all, you got to uh, be in the big, big Bigfoot 7 there. Uh, you're the right boot guy, of course. And uh, as a Highlander fan, I, of course, got to know you through the Highlander fandom because you, of course, starred in two episodes of the Highlander TV series. Uh, more famous as uh, was it Consone, of course, in um, Duende, where you uh, kind of introduced a style of fighting there, Anthony. Yes, I did. Um, uh, the uh, Spanish had a very uh, unique style of fighting, uh, sometimes referred to as the Destreza. Uh, I actually um, produced, uh, I have a couple of friends who are sword masters who have done uh, translations of the original texts, the Maestros Martinez, they're in New York. Um, and uh, they were very supportive of what I'd created because at the time that I put this together, there really wasn't any good information out there. Um, and then after the fact, I met them. They said, well, you captured the spirit of it, although it's historically not correct at all. But <laughs> uh, we were working on the Mysterious Circle, which was T-Bows, which was an offshoot of this. But uh, it was very interesting because uh, whereas all the rest of Europe were doing the more Italian... Uh, much more athletic, like Capofera, uh, one of those names that they throw out in The Princess Bride, that they actually do mean something, and uh, we can talk about that later. 
but um, they, uh, the Spanish basically they didn't change for almost three hundred years, and you know something that doesn't work doesn't survive. So, uh, but they had a very upright, defiant kind of posture, and so when I was doing consone, I wanted to get that sense of you know this. You know, the, this tremendous, uh, well, arrogance, really, but confidence. But and there's a, the, there, there was a lot of culture behind it that you were able to bring to that episode that Thank fans you. really latched on to as well. Well, without, uh, very, very quickly in this, yeah, that, um, you know, I wanted to have the, uh, you know, these staccato foot rhythms and weight changes of like a flamenco dancer. Um, my fencing master, Ralph Faulkner, um, I saw the blade work and then my work with uh, Grodin and Asanto for over a decade. Uh, I saw the footwork and I went, I understand this. Otherwise, it was sort of like Arthur Murray, you know, things on a page. But, you know, right. Brian McAllen and I, you know, brought this to life. And this is the first time it had ever been seen on film. Uh, I pitched this idea, you know, to um, when they were going to do Zorro with Antonio Banderas. And I got to present to Robert Rodriguez. But three days later, he left the project and Martin Campbell mm. brought Bob Anderson, and you're going like, well, Bob <laughs> Anderson, you know, what are you going to do? Well, and then a couple of weeks later, Highlander called me up and said, you want to go to Paris and uh, do, uh, it was originally called Mysterious Circle, and then it uh, became Duende. So it was one well, of my favorite. Well, it's also one of the fans' favorite episodes of all time, and it's always up there in the top five, top ten. And it, it's, it is a, uh, a, it's one of those things where if you in the know, it's kind of a monumental moment for uh, swordplay on film. And speaking of swordplay, you've been busy. A lot of people have seen you, maybe don't quite know the name, but they will now. Uh, of course, you were in Fearless with Jet Li in a fantastic duel. Uh, you also had some great moments in Masters of the Universe. And of course, uh, and I got to show this here, you uh, have Jaguar, li uh, Jaguar Lives and of course the Warrior and the Sorcerer. And I've got my DVDs right here. Proud of those as well. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then of course, Star Trek fans, Maj, is it Maj Kala? Yes. Maj Kala? Yeah. yeah. Maj, uh, I think. That, that was what, a, a little uh, two or three episode stint, if I remember correctly? Four. I got, I got to do four. And they kept killing me off and I kept going to the producers. Can, can I twitch a little bit on the ground can i be mostly dead but not absolutely dead just in case you want to <laughs> back. and uh jerry taylor you know as the producer she kept saying oh, it's okay you're not really dead no. okay good thank you <laughs> <laughs> and then seven well, of nine of came along and they left our space and that was the yeah. that had, that had uh one of the things i did want to bring up here too uh and i'm going to see if lee is available here lee Lee, are you available, sir? I think so. Sorry about that. All right, that. there you are. There you I'm are. Good to have technical problems. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, now, I want to get into your training here because this is really important. Uh, fans may not know that, hey, this guy in Roadhouse, he's got a lot of layers. And having also learned from you personally uh, is one of the best moments of my life. And I want to kind of touch on some of the things you've worked on here. World-renowned swordsman. Numerous acting and stunt credits, taught and performed weapon techniques in many movies and television series. Also, 2008, you were the Weapons Instructor of the Year and Black Belt Magazine Hall of Fame. And one of the things that I love about you, Anthony, is you are the master of the bullwhip. You teach it, otherwise known, and I learned this from your course, the supersonic flexible blade. I would love for you to touch on this because it's also one of the things that your wife, Mary, also helps teach and you work with her on this. And in a way, I feel like it's kind of becoming a lost art, but you are keeping it alive. Um, well, let me let, let, let me approach that uh, that you brought up from two, two, two uh, directions. First, uh, I just <laughs> last May, I celebrated 50 years as a working professional in the business. I started in uh, 1973 at the Old Globe Theater doing Shakespeare. Um, and um, they come down from the Amateur Theater to see me. I got to play Edgar in King Lear. Uh, and then I went up and um, choreographed Richard Chamberlain, the original Shogun. Um, yeah. <laughs> for, uh, you know, in Cyrano de Bergerac. And uh, that got me my equity card. And then it was back. And I continued at the Old Globe into uh, the mid 80s. I think the last thing I did was Washington. Um, but um, 
I, I have to tell you, a okay. sustained career in show business, um, diversity is very helpful. Uh, if I had to rely on just one aspect of you know things, uh, skills that I've been cultivating every day, really, um, you know, for over five decades, um, I would have starved to death. Uh, so um, I come in, I've always been an actor first, which I think helps my choreography because uh, it helps me tell a story. Uh, to me, you have verbal dialogue, and of course, there's nobody better than Shakespeare for that. Uh, and then you have physical dialogue, which is where action comes in. And some of my favorite roles, I've been able to put both of those together. Action is an enormously effective storytelling tool because it's a visceral tool. You get if done well, um, you get a priceless credibility. Like when I was training Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman, she realized I was trying to give her another vocabulary, you know, to help her create a role. And she worked very, very hard. I mean, not even Kathy Long or you know, five-time world kickboxing champion Trish Peters, you know, who did. Um, you know, her high falls and things like that. Uh, none of the girls got anywhere near her skill with the whip. And as a result, we could walk in, look at the adversity on a set, turn it into an opportunity. And we actually created things, you know, on the set with basically our rehearsal was, was our training. So I'm, I'm very big on uh, when I'm working with somebody, let me well, because I've been doing my own training for 50 years, uh, I just passed uh, 50 years of bladed weapons training. Uh, I started wow. with Amazing. my fencing master was Ralph Faulkner, who was a two-time Olympian sword master to the stars. He used to run Falcon Studios. He was my first grade teacher. And from there, I went to Taekwondo. I made it to a red belt level, but just kind of went, yeah, I'm as good a kicker as I'm ever going to be. And as a matter of fact, in the uh, Battlestar Galactica, that was, you know, one of my you know, better series of on-screen kicks. Uh, but I went to train with Dan Santo for over a decade, uh, which opened a lot of doors and eyes. And then uh, for the last 12, 13 years, I've been- I'm training uh, with him in about a month. Shinkendo. Oh, well, you can never do better than Guru Dan. You know, he is, he is, he is ageless. And I, you know, celebrate his gifts. Uh, he's with me every day. He's with me in everything I do because- Oh, um, one of his favorite sayings is no one has a monopoly on the truth, you know, and there are fundamental mm. structures that, you know, really connect all of the arts. One of the things when people come and train with me, and we can talk about that in a minute, um, I have a um, skeletal alignment structure that I utilize that I've been developing for decades. Um, but that allows me to change the tool in your hand. And this structure is still there to help you be both dynamic, but also very safe, um, you know, and it, uh, so you can, you know, you really have the tools to create um, excellent story because everything I teach comes from a martial foundation. So we're not, you know, just waving our swords around and, you know, spinning, um, you know, it drives me crazy. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned <laughs> teaching, you mentioned teaching Anthony, and I want, I want to talk about that right now. You've had you've taught some famous people here. You've taught uh, Mr. Harrison Ford and on Indiana Jones Four. You remembered you taught him how to remember the whip here, and of course, uh, there's a great uh, picture here of you working on set with Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, you had another student that hey. was uh, he's all right. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, uh, I got to do take one of your courses there uh, more than once. We did it a couple times here, including here at the uh, the L.A. Uh, Highlander Convention in 2017. Mm -hmm. And uh, Norm and I got to do uh, some additional training with you on your ranch. Not bad, right? huh? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, the view's not bad. It is a very um, inspirational yeah. place to train. Yeah, it is. And I just want to say I, I will uh, forever uh, love that memory. And uh, you guys were a great host. But I want you to talk about your training that you do uh, at your ranch there and the opportunities that people have. Okay. Oh, give me two seconds to, to go back to the whip. One of the things I'm proudest of is um, the whip dates to 3000 BC in both the Chinese and Egyptian cultures you know, that we know of. So it's 5,000 years old. Most people are happy to make a big noise. And the whip, of course, is very, very effective at that. But I find that a very low bar. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, I look on the whip as a supersonic flexible blade. So my system um, utilizes structure and alignment and the construction of the whip itself. So whereas most people yank and slash, I roll and stab. Because to me, it's a supersonic flexible blade. 
and uh, I have been refining this technique. I just came out with uh, Bullwhip Combatives at multiple ranges, which is kind of funny because for 40 years I've been taking you know care of people and making sure I don't hurt them and building in these safety factors that are invisible to anybody but us. But if you're going to take the responsibility to work with a human partner, to work on a set around people, um, you know, you you better work up to that level. And, you know, I can, that's one of the things I do is I impart information uh, quickly, effectively. And so that, you know, you have additional tools to, you know, articulate your character and tell your story. So um, I'm, I, but they, the Bull of Combatives, I combined with Grandmaster Ron Liu, uh, who is an expert at Kokoi Kenyatta and very close in fighting. And uh, we looked at my long range and where we come together, which is my medium range, his long range. And then we move into close range, and then we move into uh, uh, submission. This, this is Ron here, right? The picture. In this yes, picture? That, that's yeah. Grandmaster Ron Liu, uh, an extraordinary gentleman. And I was just so pleased because this collaboration allowed me to explore all the things that I, I was aware of, but we really went into depths with this. So I'm looking for a project, you know, where I can actually put this on screen because it's never been seen before. And yet we can do this action practically because, you know, I can either beat the hell out of you or look like I'm beating the hell out of you and, you know, not hurt you at all. And that's, of course, what we're in the business of doing is telling the story and creating an illusion. So when you come to my ranch at Rancho Indalo, uh, we have people come from all over the country, all over the world training with us here. It's teaching is one of the things I love to do because Teaching keeps me performance sharp, and as I'm finding a way to share my knowledge with you, you teach me how to teach you. I don't, I don't teach everybody the same. Um, the individual tells me how to best communicate, and as a result, I constantly get to rediscover things that I've known um, for a long time, but with a slightly different perspective, and um, that that makes it both pleasurable and valuable to me too. So. Um, I love to teach. And we also do an action vacation for people who want to come. And you know, who, Who's your favorite superhero? Who do you want to emulate? Yes, we can teach you those skills. <laughs> well, we start with bladed weapons from around the world, European, Filipino, Japanese. Um, like I said, I've just been, the last dozen years has been uh, learning Shinkendo under Kaiso Toshishiro Abata and my sensei, Matthew Lynch, is one of the senior instructors. So uh, I... We do that three days a week. My wife, Dr. Mary, and I, uh, we train because it's fun to go be a student. We're also ranked teachers there. But uh, and then the other two or three days a week, I, I teach at the ranch. I have uh, students who come in. Uh, we have people who you know come in for intensive training for like a block of time, five days, 10 days. We've got, uh, we had the Australian Stunt Academy who had come in for a decade, which that was- Oh, wow. Yeah, you get a dozen Australians, you know, around all, you know, the, the ranch and you start to work on your accent and it's, uh, you know. All... I'm, I'm married to one, so I hear that all the time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I don't need to tell you then, do I? Um, no. <laughs> we've got, last year we had the Italian stunt, uh, an Italian stunt team, team come in. They're going to come in again uh, this year before the combat. Uh, so, anyway. Um, oh, and then Chef Dr. Mary, uh, she is an extraordinary cook and she takes all of the science marries the brains of the outfit you know she has a phd in cellular biology and anatomy i'm the circus she ran off to join so <laughs> she she also cracks whips i mean i'll hold targets for her she throws knives i'll stand in front of her throwing knives she, she had a very good teacher i, I, I know the guy <laughs> uh, but uh you know so she does all the things i do with you know, horses and weapons and, and she's a tremendous teacher but she's also a world-class chef so if you come in to train with me, you you will eat very, very well. I have experienced that firsthand, and I can definitely <laughs> say so. <laughs> oh, and, but yeah, you know, one, one last thought on this, because uh, as, yeah. as you raise this subject of, um, to me, I think it's very important as a performer that um, you never stop learning, that you never stop adding to your skill set. Um, I do, I mean, you can always do more and i'd love to do more but i do a lot of voiceover and i'm always thankful of my theater background because it's given me um you know the tools and the um, uh craft you know to be able to do a lot of different voices and let the crazy things in my head come out and actually earn me a paycheck every now and again um to those of your you know uh, people watching who have seen red dead redemption 
uh, Marshall Lee Johnson in that. There's a, nice. another one I'm fond of called uh, Bullet Storm, which is, uh, you know, um, basically, I say, you sure you want me to say this? Okay. And <laughs> it's, it's the foulest mouth character I've ever played. I play General Serrano. There's apparently a thing online. You can go to Bullet Storm or General Serrano, and basically I will curse at you for half an hour. Nice. <laughs> it, it is one of the more wilder games. It is a fun drinking game. Yeah. Every That's time. You heard, oh, damn. <laughs> so, um, but it's if if you arm yourself with knowledge, knowledge gives you choices, and your art is in your choices. So you know whatever part of you know um, creativity you enjoy, whether it's in front of the camera or behind the camera. Uh, you know, whether you are more, you know, more verbal and less physical or like we you know, could tell you uh, if you are doing action, it's important that you drive story and articulate character or it's not nearly as effective as it can be. It's kind of a disservice to the project. Um, so and from that, um, <laughs> I used to worry about ideas and I, I never worry about that anymore. It also is very handy when they try to paint you into a corner. You know, that's and, a good point. Uh, yeah, and you, and you kind of go, um, you know, we could do that, but wow, you just gave me a great idea. What a great idea this is that you just had. How about if we do this? You can do that. Yes, yes, I can. And you know, and we can do it live, and we can do it in one or two takes. And <laughs> arm yourself with knowledge. Yeah, mm -hmm. Lee. Uh, Lee, I know you've wanted to at least <coughs> answer or ask a question regarding uh, any training or his courses and i want to give you the opportunity here because lee is a fellow stuntman actor uh he's and, and lee uh, talk about real quick to uh your your um stuntman group you got going on yeah i just uh founded uh, minnesota's first uh stunt crew uh oh. we're the fight monkeys um and <laughs> we try not well, to take ourselves too seriously like uh but uh we actually just booked a uh a thing at warner brothers <laughs> next winter um and you're at, at warner there. brothers next year you said yeah uh next winter yeah nice uh so that's our second gig we're already at warner brothers but Wonderful. uh i was thinking you know when we're done we might take that hour drive up to rancho indalo and uh you know maybe partake of one or two courses and uh some of this famous uh, food that you have going on there um <laughs> seriously uh contact me let's talk about it because i can really speed your learning curve and everything that i share with you will connect to everything else and i'll That's show fantastic. you that um you know that foundational structure and then the only thing that changes is the nature of the tool that's in your hand each thing well, offers yeah. you opportunities and you know vulnerabilities and that's where i think interesting choreography comes in so I'd love and uh, you're also the foundation of my choreography i started 20 plus years ago uh, with uh, Anthony Delange's broadsword for the stage and screen, I still have it on VHS. Uh, but my first day—it's now on... up online. I just finally got all of those things <laughs> up online. It's on Buy Me a Coffee, so I'm hoping uh, you will share that, uh, you know, on screen at the end of this. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And anyone listening, they're fantastic sets. Uh, you'll see a very young, very dark haired Dave Baker in the background of some of the shots. Uh, Mr. Bob Chapin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, so, some familiar faces to the stunt world. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic series. And, um, but uh, really looking forward to it. And um, of course, you know, everything you've done, uh, I just have to reiterate I think probably the most exciting fight I ever saw you do was uh, the Jet Li fight. Uh. <laughs> had to bring my A game for that one. <laughs> I tell you about that, they, um, we had no rehearsal. I mean, you're you're aware that in uh, <laughs> in one of the great things about stage is you get some rehearsal, you know, and mm -hmm. you do things chronologically, which is very helpful. You know, there there's an old joke in you know, Shakespeare that well, Shakespeare never wrote any fight scenes because, of course, he did. He wrote four acts of who's <laughs> going to show up and do the final fight. Those better be the people who show up to do the final fight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very rich, uh, you know, um, uh, text from which to mine things. Um, the <laughs> Sorry, you, uh, you, you, you took me off down a tangent. In film and television, though, you almost get no time. 
like yeah. we uh, we shot the final sequence uh, in Duende, you know, the fight in the rain with rapier and dagger in Paris, chosen so you'd see the Eiffel Tower in the background, but it's pissing down rain the whole time, so visibility is about a hundred feet, so you don't see the Eiffel Tower at all, uh, and it's slippery as hell, you know, uh, you know where we are, and there's some good outtakes where you can see all that. But um, we literally, uh, we made it, we had shown, we had made it up the night before. We'd shown it once to Adrian. I did a final limousine shot. We came back the next morning. Well, we'll rehearse it, you know, when we get to the set the next day. We got there and it's raining and there's no cover set, you know. So basically, you know, we just went out and started the film. And then the lighting was so awful um, that they just said, okay, let's stop. We'll wait till it gets dark. We'll pump light through it. It'll be like they've been fighting all day. And boom. And so we again turned the end opportunity. But, the uh, yeah. but with Jet Li, um, you know, I arrived a week early. I was hoping to work with the team. They were running behind with the final sequence with the Japanese um, you know, gentleman. And uh, they were having to shoot things in very small pieces. Um, so I met them when I walked on the set. The first thing that, um, <laughs> the first thing Wu Ping wanted me to do was pokey, 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 uh, because he thought that European sword play was what he'd seen in the movies, which is a whole lot of arm pumping. And, you know, it's just like, oh, and I'm going, OK, I will give you three thrusting attacks, but I will not pokey, pokey, pokey. And um, so we got ourselves through that first phrase. Um, <laughs> basically what happened was the team would throw something together when uh, jet and Wu Ping were happy jet and i would get up and walk it maybe twice and then we'd shoot it at speed and then we'd go on and we'd do it all over again literally we were making it up on the spot and i realized that they were having me attack to um quadrants you know and i'm going okay that's not necessarily logical and certainly not the way i would do it but this is your house so you know uh, i have to you know fit in here and I said, do you mind? I will I will do those moves. Do you mind if I get there this way because there's a better flow? Uh, and apparently somebody said, uh, who's choreographing this? Us or the Guaylo, which is not a uh, <laughs> complimentary term. And Wu Ping said, this Guaylo knows what he's doing. And from that point on, we never had any problem. Jet and I got along famously. Um, uh, he was very complimentary and said, you know, your skills and you know, this is why you're here and <laughs> uh, but we, we literally made it up. Neither one of us knew the choreography 10 minutes earlier. A, a, each wow. one of those phrases was made up and shot at speed. And Jet at speed is, you know, a marvel. Uh, and I had to totally commit to where he was going to be. But thanks to my, you know, uh, long, the structure I've been creating a long time, I never actually released the sword until I knew he was going to be there. My whole body was. You know, attacking and doing the stuff, but the final release of the sword to contact, you know, I I didn't until I knew he was. I don't know how you got from there to there, but here you are. So here we go. <laughs> well, I think I think you made him sweat. So it, when you watch that movie, you could definitely uh, see that uh, it was. Well, it that's, was uh, that, that's that, that is that is nice because you know you mentioned uh, antagonist or bad guys. Uh, I have made a career, you know like to think i'm not done yet but i've made a career out of being worthy antagonists for the hero because if you don't have a strong you know antagonist your protagonist hero is not much of a hero so um i've always liked you know being that guy that they whole thing about highlander is uh you know of course he's, he's going to win you know where you'd have no show you've got 22 more episodes to do this season but you know you have to make it look like he's not sure whole thing about duende is he's lost this guy before twice yeah. <laughs> and as a matter of fact he still did i i was the one that came up with the idea that okay how is he going to you know lose but still win by pulling himself up onto my sword so that i can't use it anymore you know great great Pretty highlander cool. tv episode for those of you that have not seen that make sure you check it out uh, duende one of the the best Best TV episodes, in my opinion, it's it's fantastic. Um, well, well, I'm kind of hoping thought... that they'll notice when they do this reboot, but you know, <laughs> yeah. it, would, it would be lovely to get to contribute. But we'll see. yes, uh, if you know anyone uh, connected to the Highlander reboot, anyone listening or watching this, this is the guy you need to talk to. He knows what he's talking about. He I mean, uh, Ramirez, right there. 
Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I understand that, you know, I mean, of course, I would love to play a role, but I would also, uh, I'd love to collaborate. I'd love to, you know, offer my experience and skills. And uh, very often these days, if I'm not in front of the camera, you know, I specialize in coming in and helping somebody else make the most of their character action opportunities, uh, you know, and working with the wealth of knowledge. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, all right. I hate to have to go to waste. <laughs> <laughs> let's go ahead and let's talk about Roadhouse, Anthony. Uh, you are in one of the uh, best <laughs> 80s action films of all time. We've pulled it up right there. It's celebrating its 30th anniversary, no, and not. you get to play one of the villains, <laughs> one of the coolest villains. And by the way, one of the smartest villains, knowing when to shoot a car in midair and make it blow up. Uh, also gave Patrick Swayze's character quite a run uh, on some fighting and stuff. I'd like you, uh, the first question I have for you is how did you get involved with Roadhouse? Well, uh, I rather vividly remember this is back in the day when you actually uh, got to go into a room to audition. And you actually got to audition for the director and as, uh, as often as not, the, the producer was there too. Uh, I truly miss those days. Um, but I came into a little tiny room, you know, out of another room that was full of other actors and performers, you know, sucking up the oxygen and um, <laughs> uh, into a room that had the director behind the desk and another thing. It was much bigger than a closet, which kind of, you know, okay. Um, but I was introduced by the casting director as this is Anthony DeLongis. He's another black belt. I went, well, yes, thanks. <laughs> Why don't you kick me in the shin and throw some cold water in my face and then have me read? But uh, apparently um, Rowdy liked what he saw. And, uh, you know, I got to come in and play catch him. And, uh, you know, of course, we had Marshall Teague, you know, as uh, Ben Gazar as, you know, the top hit, but he gets his throat ripped out. So, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that left me around for, you know, a final confrontation. Well, hold on, hold on. You, you had a really good death scene too. Not only did you get, uh, impaled in the gut by your own knife, but then you became a human shield for a shotgun. Well, Tails I like to think that I was only mostly dead. And um, you know, they, they've made two <laughs> movies since then. I didn't get a call for either one. It's like, like when I played blade, I'm going, okay, blade just disappears. We didn't see him die. You know, uh, Maybe he can come back. There's supposed to be a reboot of that, too. And I'd be happy to be man at arms. But anyway, with <laughs> this death, um, you talked about shooting the uh, car out of the air. That was kind of fun. Yes. Um, um, uh, Paterni, um, um, Chuck, uh, the coordinator, he said, okay, you're going to stand here, and I want you to shoot two shots with this bump shotgun and then move because my son's going to hit that pipe ramp near the twirling and he's going to land right where you're standing. And <laughs> sure enough, I went bam, bam, move. And up, uh, you know, well, actually I had to wait till it hit the pipe ramp and was in the air so that I was shooting the underbelly of it. And then before it could land on me, I had to move. Uh, and he landed right where I had been standing. So that was <laughs> oh, Jeez. Uh-huh. And uh you know, Charlie Paterni. But um that's old school, you know. Um but yeah, that was very cool. And then this is one of the things I'm very proud of. Um when it comes time when we're, you know, find that brick when I used to be on my reel, you know, uh, <laughs> um my acting reel. But uh so the everybody, you know, and there's bodies littered and I, I come in the room and I'm I'm turning around. And I have a shotgun and I have a full load blanket and I'm supposed to blow the lampshade, you know, the shade on the standing lamp apart with this before we do our fight. Uh, it's practical. And, you know, and the whole thing is I'm coming and there's a close up on me and he's behind me, isn't he? And I'm going to turn. Well, the way nobody said anything to me. Um, but I got, I have the knife, I have the gun here. So if I turn, I'm going to be leading with the shotgun. And <laughs> um, Patrick is going to block the shotgun with his foot, one of his magic kicks. You know, with, then I'm going to pull the trigger, blow up the lampshade, and then we're going to fight. He's going to take the gun away, and then we're going to have our knife fight. Um, well, I'm going, if I'm leading this, boy, there is no safety in this at all. So on my way in, I shifted the gun. 
I know, noticed so that actually when I was watching today. My whole body turns first, so the gun is last. So, I mean, Lee will appreciate this. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things where have your head on your shoulders, anticipate what could be a problem, turn it into an opportunity, but build in an extra layer of safety because this was a practical stunt. I literally blew the, the lampshade off. If I had pulled that trigger in Patrick's face, you know, I would never have forgiven myself and we wouldn't have this movie <laughs> to celebrate. Mm -hmm. So well, and, uh, in watching it, you see that as you move through, mm -hmm. when you shift uh, to the left-handed grip, you're always coming up on a uh, a right turning corner. So it mm -hmm. makes sense that your gun would be to that side. So mm -hmm. like it didn't even play off like you did it for a stunt. It played off like you did it for a tactical choice, and it, it comes off beautifully. And you've got Thank your hand you. ready for the knife. Thank you. So uh, no, I but I, but it was one of those things that. Uh, well, nobody's going to say anything about this. I think I better fix this myself. But as you said, I tried to make it look like this is my tactical choice because I'm yeah. coming around the corner. But I built that in so that I could take care of Patrick. Nice. Uh, now, uh, did anyone... <laughs> that's, that's, that's what you call arming yourself with knowledge, which is what we were discussing. <laughs> Lacey, I know you had a question for Anthony uh, for Roadhouse. Yeah, I just wanted to know how much time you spent in the monster truck, and were you the one who actually got to drive it through the car dealership? Um, <laughs> I have a mild obsession with monster trucks and monster truck rallies and stuff like that. It's just delightful. Um, I'm sure they are quite cathartic. <laughs> 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 um, I did get to drive it. I got to drive it up the driveway, which was very cool. It was a little tricky. Because um, you have the steering wheel is operating the front wheels. And then there's like a little, it was the sort of thing that you would lock your window with. It was like a little, a little lever that was on the, uh, the door, you know, right by, you can see this picture of me. It's like right about where my elbow is that operates the back wheels. Uh, so you can be turning the front wheels, but if you don't turn the back wheels in sequence and harmony with it, the truck, the, the truck will crab sideways which I guess is useful for all the stuff that they're going to do. So I did get to do that, getting down out of it back when I had the knees to be able to do it. It still felt like I needed a parachute because it was way. <laughs> um, but uh, I was not the guy who uh, drove it. You know, that's we had the professional do that because that, again, that was a practical stunt. Um, there, there was going to be no back to one. You know, he was going to mm -hmm. go through all that glass and then he was going to crush all of those cars. And it's not like we could have shot it again. <laughs> so yeah, I, I very happily went, I'm glad I don't have the responsibility for this. I'll just save Patrick's life with a shotgun. You would have. You <laughs> That's uh, Lee, Lee, you got a question, uh, Roadhouse question here for Anthony? Uh, yeah, I just wondered. Um, this is actually the first of a couple times you worked with Travis McKenna. And I know that Robert's worked with him a couple times. Is that, uh, is there a story there? Is that just a. Who's Travis? He Who's was Travis? the heavy set bouncer. Ah, uh, yeah, Travis. Um, Cause I know yes, he was Travis. in Batman with you. Yeah. Yeah. He was one of the terror clowns. Um, yeah, that was, <laughs> that's one of the things, if you ask me about the, the new one, I'll, I'll have a commentary on it. <laughs> um, Cause I watched it last night in preparation for this, but um uh yeah we 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 all got along really really well uh we all took uh, very good care of each other um it was it was a pleasure to you know be on this shoot um uh, <laughs> it's the most fun i ever had in the downtime uh you know people who movies are wonderful um making movies is like making sausage uh, you know, you know, it's, and there's a lot of sit around and wait, you know, we've got to relight, we've got to, you know, take and, you know, turn around and get coverage from the other direction, which means we can relight and blah, 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 blah. And we would just sit on set and Jeff Healy would play. And I'm just like, like Take your time. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> and, <laughs> really play anything. and I think, you know, his music is one of the beating heart uh, successes of you know what makes the original so good uh, but it made it made time on set really wonderful um that's awesome uh, yeah Tra travis travis was very nice i didn't ever actually get to fight travis uh but in those big you know fight sequences um it was not i actually have another scene that you don't see um 
that that still the black and white still that you have of me fighting Patrick. Yeah, you know, this yes. is after the drive the boot in and blah blah blah, and then we come back again and uh, yeah, this black and white one. Um, Marshall Teague and Sam Elliott are going at it, you know, just off of um, Patrick's right shoulder, and Ben Gazar is sitting at the bar, and uh, you know uh, Charlie and. Um, Benny, Benny the Jet or Kitas, who is who trained uh, Patrick, did a terrific job. Patrick's a dancer. He and he trained him to music, um, so it was it made it very successful and you know helped Patrick really look, really look good, and, you know come off well in this. But he said, "Can you do this axe kick on this, um, you know, uh, mug of beer?" And I'm going in these pants. With it up over my head and come down, but I did it. But I guess they decided that there was enough people to cut to, and you know the story was more about, uh, you know, Sam and uh, Marshall. Uh, so, but I do have another whole fight sequence going on with Patrick. You know, that's just off frame. That's one of those things where that was a really good sequence. How come they didn't use it? <laughs> Kyle, do you <laughs> got a question, my, Anthony? My character never learned because every time I, you know, I have a fight with Patrick and I'd lose. I have a fight with Patrick and I'd lose. <laughs> <laughs> the, the drag out to the, um, the, you know, outside after he reacts my boot off and throws it up on the roof and then we go at it. You know, one of the things I'm proudest of is um, when I throw a hook on, on screen, it's horizontal. You know, you, you mm -hmm. watch and it drives me crazy. I watch I watch movies and you watch people throwing the punch like a foot and a half over the other, you know, their partner's head. And, you know, they're, they're just trying to take care of it. But it comes back to the training. Because I'm always throwing my body first, and then whatever's in my hand or my hand last, you're not aware of it because you see the jeopardy. You know, you see, you see the load, ah. you see the unload, and you see this. But this is the last thing. Most people do that first, uh, which means <laughs> it better go well because that's where you always hear these um, stories about people tagging each other. You know, uh, uh, you know, on set. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> My very I, first I day on set, I got stabbed in the spear. But I like it because I can throw that. Like when I worked with Tom Cruise in Far and Away, it was the same thing. I saw, okay, he is very consistent. Um, so I would actually lean into his punches so that, you know, I would track where he was going to go. So, And they cut me into the, um, the montage sequence four times. So that was actually pretty cool. Nice. Uh, Kyle, you got so, a question? Oh, sorry, Anthony. Uh, Oh, I was just going to say, my friend Carl Carafalo is a uh, you know, wonderful stuntman, and he was the, he played the Italian boxer. In that. Uh, oh, that's that was cool. another fun adventure, you know. I just I just came along for <laughs> to play um, Walter Scott, who I've worked for many many times. Uh, Walter did um, he did the stunts for uh, Masters of the Universe, and you know I got to play Blade. I got to create a character that didn't exist in the Attorney, you know, Empire, um, and that was really cool. Um, but I came also back for the show. Up, I also ended up doubling Frank Langella, uh, which was a hoot. And I trained and I trained uh, Dolph. And again, here's the movies. Yeah, I trained him for a month. Then I didn't see him for a month. And then I kept talking to Walter. When when can I show you? you know, when can I see the set? You know, when so I can show you some ideas. You tell me what you like. And he uh, he said, Ah, you know, quit bugging me. You know, we're going to be down there for six weeks. You know, and we'll have lots of time. We get down there. What do you think was the first thing we shot? The fight. <laughs> I had an hour. You know, and, I, and, I, and I said, you know, I said to Dolph, remember that thing I taught you in training with the two sword, blah, 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 blah. And that was, you know, I, I had maybe an hour to work with him and, and we shot that. And then I'm actually catching uh, Pons Mars, who was the guy who played Saurad, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know the, the lizard creature. <laughs> you know, I'm wearing 50 pounds of chain mail. My chain mail was made of, uh, 50 feet of pipe cut into quarter inch pieces. They never tell me how much it actually weighed. Uh, and I'm wearing surgical rubber. So at the end of the day, when I finally get out of the suit, I would take my boots and I expected a fish to come out as uh, the amount of water that would come out of that boot. Was... <laughs> <laughs> I actually had the wardrobe assistant write me a letter saying, I've never had, you know, a more, you know, performer unfriendly wardrobe and i'm worried about you you know make sure that you hydrate <laughs> <laughs> so that was very fun um but yeah so uh I, uh, that that's what happened so you you know you it is a luxury if you get you know rehearsal 
So that's why your rehearsal happens before you get to set, so you have choices and you can you can work under you know the high pressure, and that is very often what happens on a film set. Kyle, you got a question? Yeah, on the Roadhouse set, you've got so many characters and you've got so many tough guys in there, including the great Terry Funk. Uh -huh. I just. I, I just can't imagine there is not some crazy Terry Funk story. And I do have one other question. Did you get to keep the boot? <laughs> no. No, I didn't. Um, it's funny. I, I, have a, I have a friend who, uh, I guess he went to the screening of the new one and um, the other day. And um, he apparently went out and got a razor and put it in his boot, you know, so that he could go, uh, you know, and... <laughs> <laughs> and a razor blade in his boot at the screening, and I guess Benny was there, and um, you know he came up afterwards. And Benny was leaning against the wall. He expressed his preference for um, you know, and, and and his appreciation for what Benny had done in the original pitch, which was terrific. So. <laughs> the right That's boot cool. was on. No, I didn't get to. <laughs> um, yeah. Terry, Terry was a hoot. Um, I didn't. I wasn't really a wicked. I'm old. Uh, you couldn't just Google somebody in those days. I mean, I, I still had a pager and uh, I don't think I had, no, I, you were still looking for pay phones to be able to, you know, answer your pager and shit like that. Um, so there wasn't, you know, I couldn't go on Google and go, geez, Terry Funk, look at his career. Look at the things he's done and accomplished. And that. <laughs> I wasn't that aware of him other than, you know, he, he come from a WWE, but he had these crazy cowboy boots um that had laces on them you know and i guess that was part of his um you know in the ring persona you know so i one day i commented on those other those are some pretty cool boots you got there <laughs> but yeah and uh you know he was uh uh he, he was sometimes i i'd like to laugh you know you've gone to the uh, wwe school of um dramatic articulation which you know, I mean, it's, it's really loud and, you know, not and barely, you know, barely in, you know, com incomprehensible. Um, Terry wasn't, you know, when, you know, he would, he would in character go off as that guy. You could still understand what he was saying. And he was, he was an intimidating presence, a really nice guy. That's a good question, Kyle. I'm glad you brought that up. Anthony, I, you brought it up and we're going to discuss it at the end of the podcast. Um, but, and so... I've got a two point. I got a two part question for you here. I wanted to get your thoughts on the uh, the legend that is Roadhouse 1989 because it, it is a cult favorite. It's playing all the time somewhere. I think it's on uh, Paramount Plus now. We've got our own uh, physical media copies. Uh, I want you to kind of comment on that. But then you watch the new one, the 2024 one with uh, uh, Jake Jake Gyllenhaal. I want to get your thoughts on that as well. Which one first? <laughs> okay. The Legend of um, Roadhouse 89. Well, um, you know, uh, Legend is always a uh, gets bad, gets bad. It, anyway, it it um, survives. Did you say 35 years? Bath is not much. Yeah, 35 years. Uh, you know, and you're just like, holy crap. Um, it was a fun adventure uh, with a terrific team full of a lot of very talented people. Um I, I, you know, I, I said I just celebrated 50 years in the business. Um, what's wonderful is when you get everybody coming and giving their best because they feel like they're appreciated and, you know, you work as a team and the product shows it ends up on screen. Um, it's, it's not always the case, uh, but this was a case of nobody, everybody respected everybody else's, um, contribution and collaboration and everybody took care of everybody because uh, there was you know these, these are all practical stunts and um, there wasn't a whole lot of time taken with coverage um, you know there, there there wasn't any um, you know, rigging and wire work or any of that uh, which can be enormously effective and uh, it's especially good when you're not you know when you have superpowers um, you know, it helps tell those stories, but this wasn't that kind of story. Uh, you know, this was very rough and tumble and, you know, so it was nice 
you had uh, when we had the big bar <coughs> sequence. I mean, it, it had just about every stuntman I'd ever seen or worked with before. Um, it's funny because when I'm walking in from outside to come in for the introduction of the right boot, Alan Graff is next to me. I don't know if you notice in that uh, still picture, but when I get inside, it's somebody else. I'm not sure why. I always look at this and kind of go, what the hell happened to Alan? I've, I've worked with Alan several times uh, since then when I taught um, Ellen Barkin to use the whip. Uh, she played Calamity Jane and Wild Bill. Uh, I also taught uh, Angelica Houston, who also played a, uh, a Calamity Jane with uh, Sam Shepard in, uh, not Sam Shepard, Sam Elliott, rather, in um, Buffalo Girls. Um, hmm. And I, I worked with uh, Walter Hill, uh, and uh, I trained uh, Ellen Barkin with the whip. And then I just did a thing for Walter Hill again for Dead for a Dollar. I came in and uh, I did some whip work, which is nice. Alan coordinated that and called me up and finally let me come in. And I had like, <laughs> it was over a long holiday weekend. And I thought, oh, because I said, you know, if you give me a couple of days, I can get the actors to do this. You know, I can give them enough to wear. And then I can do any insert shots if you need it. See, the, if you see a performer actually do a piece of action, um it's, it's why michelle Pfeiffer's woman is so effective she does all her own whip action so you know and when the audience sees the performer do it you get a credibility that is literally priceless um indiana jones alas uh prior to crystal skull there's one start to finish shot everything's done in pieces um temple of doom you know the waste wrap and stuff it's done in pieces the most recent one, uh, you know, I, I I did get a shot in Crystal Skull, but I didn't. I got to pre I got to prep him, but I didn't get to be on set the way I was with uh, Michelle, so we weren't able to create things, you know, on, on the set. It's just the nature of that particular project. But uh, on the most recent one, you know, the you don't see him actually use the whip. It's all it's all pieces, and it tells the story, um, but it doesn't give you the credibility to actually see something. Um, right. You know, so, you know, when I have somebody, it's like you, this character's going to throw a knife. Let me see him do it once. And then you can do all the camera tricks you want because you have the credibility and the audience will suspend their disbelief and they'll go along with it. So um, that's that's another one of my pet peeves. It's like, take the time, make the investment, train the performer so that, you know, they have the confidence to. And it can be something very simple. It can be like, I'm going to do a half spin into the wall. <laughs> If you've ever seen um, OK Corral with um, Burt Lancaster and Kirk mm -hmm. Douglas, and Kirk plays uh, Doc Holliday, and the first time we see him, he's drunk, he's pissed off at his girlfriend, Big Nose Kate, and he's throwing um, he's throwing knives into a door. He's sitting in a chair <laughs> throwing knives into a door, and you're watching him do it, and you're just like going, "This guy's a badass," you know. I think I think it was one of my inspirations for wanting to you know, learn how to do shit. Uh, half the things that uh, I've learned how to do, it's because somebody asked me if I could do them, and at the time I couldn't. So when I went out, I went out and learned how. So now I'm always trying to go. Um, you know, uh, Walter Scott. You know, so he, he did a. Uh, oh God, it was a while. It was a um, Lone Ranger, and uh, he, at some point he said, "I don't know if they, you know there's any sword play in this." I, uh, and, and uh, there wasn't any whip work, and you know, and he said archery. You know, I said, "What do you know about archery?" He says, "Well, not enough, because you know, when you tell Walter you know how to do something, you better know how to do it better than anybody else on the set, at least, you know." And you know, but I then went out and I can do archery for horseback. <laughs> it's nice. Nice. I've I've seen your videos too of doing it, doing, <laughs> the, whip, doing the whip work on the horseback as well. It's amazing. Okay, you got to get your opinion. Everyone has one. Talking about, of course, the new Roadhouse. What are your thoughts on it? Um, I think um, Jake uh, Gyllenhaal did a terrific job. I mean, he looks great. He obviously worked really hard. Um, there was... My biggest disappointment um, it was in story. Um, and probably the, the place where it shows itself the most is there is no, um, 
you don't get to meet anybody else. Yeah, you know, like in in the classic Roadhouse, you know, in our Roadhouse, there's a mm-hmm. lot of characters who um, you know show up, get enough time on screen to um, it. It makes us like you know Patrick's Dalton that much more. Because, you know, he has to win them over. He has to show them some things. He has to, he puts together a team of people. And they kind of soft touch it in this. You know, he says, yeah, when the guy pulls the knife from under his shirt and he does this, pop him in the face. And then you see him again at the end after Pat, after uh, Jake's character has left. And they're sort of putting the, you know, the bar back together again. And, you know, he has like three little things. It's hard to tell who anybody is in, you know, the big brawls. Um, I just... You know the uh, you know when you 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 have the girl who um... oops oh yeah, we lost oh we lost him <laughs> all right uh, Anthony uh, uh, go ahead and click on the link again and we'll get we'll get you back on here sorry about that we don't know what happened there I don't know um, well while we're here guys let's get your quick thoughts on Roadhouse uh, uh, Lee what about you what were your thoughts on Roadhouse. Oh, uh, honestly, uh, what Anthony was saying, uh, kind of same thing. Like, there's no um, real supporting characters to really give anything other than action to this. Um, you know, uh, McGregor being a, a good fighter and everything, uh, and definitely a, a, a personality in real life. Um, I sort of felt like he was just doing promo for his next fight and not really, you know, playing a character. Um, I don't think that you can recreate how enjoyable the original roadhouse was. Cause like it's the legend of two famous bouncers. Like I've been bouncing forever and I can name like three people and they're friends of mine. Like, I don't know any famous bouncers and nobody does, you know, like it's, but somehow that worked, you know, and you've got, you know, a, uh, a doctor that falls for this guy and is fine swimming in the lake that he dragged a dead body through. Uh, at the end of the movie, like there's just so much charm and earnestness and uh, luck in the first one. You can't really recreate it. And I don't think they came close to it. Gotcha. Uh, Lacey, what about you? What are your thoughts on Roadhouse 2? Excuse me, Roadhouse Reboot. Sorry. Yeah, Reboot. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have thoughts on Roadhouse 2 as well, but uh, the, the reboot, I enjoyed it as a standalone movie it was a standalone like an action movie or whatever i don't think it necessarily needed to be called roadhouse um i think they tried to uh i think it was fun for for what it was but they could have called it you know kelsey's shack by the sea and it still would have been the same movie um Mm -hmm. i will say that conor mcgregor i swear i first of all i just saw mcgregor and gyllenhaal as the thing on the and i was like why are they getting you and McGregor to fight? <laughs> like I was completely anyway. So I had no idea what was going on in the movie. Conor McGregor. I feel like if Ross Marquand and Bane from Batman. Yes. Like, it's, he's that he's the two of them. Like he's basically Tom Hardy. Um, Tom Hardy. Yes. Thank you. And it was good. It was not roadhouse for me. Everyone looked great. Everyone, you know, fighting out. Like I said, but I think that the storyline is probably where it's a little bit lacking. And um, I think that they tried to uh, highlight certain things, but they had too many things going on instead of focusing on a couple of small things like they did in the original. The original had, like Lee was saying, you know, a cast of, you know, five or eight characters and they introduced them all. You get the idea of what they're, what's going on and then you see them react to the problem. This, it was like you had the bar owner and then the employees and then the bookstore and then the, the hospital. I mean, it was just sort of everything everywhere. And then there was Travis Van Winkle, Winkle was there for like one scene. I mean, what? How did they get Travis Van Winkle for one scene? <laughs> it was crazy. Maybe that was a tribute to Keith David only having one scene in the, Maybe? In the original. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, Here's right. Here's the phone. That's his entire role, and he's on the poster. <laughs> exactly. So it was kind of like maybe we can let's see if we can get a few cameos, like random. Okay. Um, the whole police thread line was was weird because there was, there was two different police source forces, which didn't make a whole lot of sense. And then there was the connection between the doctor and the police. It was there was some confusion, to say the least. I'll say All that. Right. Okay. 
Uh, Kyle, let's go ahead and uh, get your uh, quick thoughts on uh, Road. Yeah, let's get your thoughts. So, I, for me, if this movie was named anything but Roadhouse, I would have probably found it a little more enjoyable. I, um, I agree. It just didn't have. Jillian Hall was great. I, I, I think Jillian Hall was really good in it. But I think too is that what didn't have the characters in it you didn't have that outside group to identify with the setting of the keys just felt almost too laid back it's, it's too laid back to have this roadhouse going on and I, so I, I was i was a little with, off with that but there's some good there, there's some good sequences in it i just felt like they didn't really set on a direction with it it was like okay we're gonna take some tribute po points here you mix mixing the UFC stuff, obviously McGregor being basically just McGregor turning himself even up more than <laughs> than normal in in this film. It's it's a fun film. It's it's not the worst two hours I've seen, but you know, for me it's just, it was a movie and it just existed. Gotcha, gotcha. Kind of where I was at. Lacey, you got a comment? Yeah. Also, I feel like. 45 minutes, 48 minutes into the movie, you find out what the reason for it was. And it became like an old school dance battle movie. Like all of a sudden it was the real estate guy who was trying to take over things. And it was like, what? where did that come from? All of a sudden it was like the, the storyline of break in or step up or any number of, of dance battle movies. Um, so that was kind of a hard left turn for me. Gotcha. Yeah, you know, I've I've heard these uh, th these points before, and they're all valid. I, you know, wh when I approached watching this film, I knew it was not going to hold a candle to the original '89 film that we're celebrating today. So I went in going, I'm I'm just going to treat this as its own film uh, that has the same name and will have a th similar theme. And I went in with that kind of mind frame with it, and I do that with all remakes because I've learned my lesson. Uh, getting my hope up too high on something before I watch it just doesn't work. I'm just going to tr treat it, treat it as its uh, its own entity. And I went in and I was entertained for uh, for two hours. I there was moments that I liked about it. I did think Connor was way over the top, uh, <laughs> but I did like some of the action scenes. And I thought this the uh, the scenery, the set in the Keys, but it was actually filmed in Dominican Republic, uh, was was a nice little uh, add to it. But I think Anthony made a good point there. There was a lot of the co-stars that you didn't really get a chance to know well. It didn't really have good moments in it. Uh, and the movie's longer than the original Roadhouse, so they could have spent a little bit more time on that. Anthony, are you back here? I hope so. Am I? Yes, you are. <laughs> hey. Sorry about Sorry that. Sorry about that. Like I said, I think I, I think my pager went off and I had to go find a payphone. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we were we were just giving our thoughts on it, and you made a, you made a good point about how I felt that you really wanted to learn more about the other characters more, and I thought that that was its biggest flaw, in my opinion. I, I was expecting a, a you know a roadhouse, and yeah, maybe the main villain on the boat. I that guy should have been someone else, someone more established, not some like snotty guy that just had a well, bunch of money and didn't know what to do with it, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I found I, I thought there were weaknesses in the script. I'm also um, I mean, Doug Lyman is a terrific director. Uh, I was, <laughs> of course, you know, it's easy, easy to armchair quarterback. But uh, initially, the color, one of the things about the original Roadhouse is the vibrancy of the colors. Um, both visually on the screen and um, in the characters that uh, you know the, that were created, um, the initial color palette that uh, the cinematographer and Doug used for whatever reason, I you know I turned to my wife and I said, "Why is this sepia? Sepia is usually <laughs> the tone you use for um, flashbacks, you know. So and yeah. you, and and you know and if we're in the it, it's weird. I've been around a long time, you know, and you know I mean." Um, I, I don't have Doug Lyman's, you know, experience behind the camera. And, and anyway, his body of work is tremendous, and I, I'm a big fan. But I looked at this, and I just kind of, why does this look like this? Why does this have this color? And then, you know, the 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 location for the bar itself. I kept going, why is anybody fighting for this? This is a little bit like, um, you know, uh, you know, when you're when you're in Mexico and you're down on the beach, and basically you have a couple of palm fronds, you know, over top of a 
you know, a bamboo skeleton or whatever. Uh, anyway, the, the you watch the transformation of the original roadhouse, um, you know, from the chicken wire thing or whatever. Anyway, it's just when, uh, you know, when he comes to say, I need help, you know, I've got, I got a little bit of money. I want to, you know, I want to upgrade this, but first I've got to make it safe or people aren't going to want to come, you know, we're sweeping out the eyeballs, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and then you watch and when, you know, when, um, Dalton has come in and he's kind of put things, uh, you know, under control and, you know, they, they've upgraded the inside and, um, but there's, there's just color, you know, there's color in the lighting, you know, it, it, it's funny cause you're looking at the, uh, I'm going to try not to disconnect us again. Um, but you're looking at the, um, you, you had the, the artwork, you know, from the new one, you know, with, uh, um, with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal uh, uh, on there, you never see the color that's on the the box in the DVD box on the screen. I don't know why, you know. Uh, and these these are little things that you know. I mean, I, I I don't I don't go into a movie going, you know. I'm I have an opinion. I don't care what they do. I I go in to be entertained. And it's only when right. you know, things happen that pull me out of the movie that I start going, why? Um, you know, and they, they, I mean, they reference things, you know, I said, I said to Mary, okay, so we're going to burn the bookstore instead of the, uh, you know, Red's uh, auto parts store. Um, but, uh, none of the rest of that little, you know, shopping mall burned or, you know, um, there, there are elements that they, they, they were, they were trying to flesh out the characters, but, you know, we just didn't get that kind of development of the supporting characters that I think helped make the original much yeah. more magical because it's there. There are two things that make you judge, a, uh, you know, a, <laughs> you know, a, um, a character. It's, um, you know, what does he do? You know, uh, and well, you know, what does he say? But what do other people say about him? You know, yeah. and just you didn't get any of that articulation. Um, uh, and it's I, I was kind of saying, you know, the you know, Garrett Warren did the uh, did the action and Garrett's a very accomplished and, um, you know, uh, and there are some pieces on it that's quite brutal. But there are also some things where I'm, I'm not sure what I'm watching. And the only people I am watching are Connor and, you know, Jake. And I don't see any of the other people in the background. You know, what are they doing? What's important? You know, what? It, I, I think, too, and I want to mention that in the in the original, one of the things that, that Patrick Swayze's character says that's quite foreboding it was when he says it's going to get worse before it gets better. And that starts right away when he fires uh, the bartender, because then he comes back, you know, and 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 so you know that there's a connection there. there there's something it sets a tone that gives that character death as well, and not to mention a good death scene at the end. Well, he, he also, you know, Jake Care. I wasn't going to go into this much depth, but you know, Jake, um, you know, does say that um, you got me angry. You know, it's it's not easy to get me angry, but you you don't want to see me angry. It's a little bit of a Hulk line. But <laughs> I didn't really see much difference, you know. Right. I mean, he um, he he was he was very likable, um, you know, the character that he had. But um, and he, I was having trouble associating, you know. I guess I kind of looked at the thing in the ring that has supposedly been haunting him throughout, and you get um, it was like, well, shouldn't the referee have stopped this sooner? Because once the guy can't protect himself, that's when the referee's supposed to step in. So, how was it? Well, <laughs> my wife and I every year we watch The Quiet Man on St. Patty's Day. We watch The Quiet Man and we watch Waking Ned Divine, and we drink Irish whiskey. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, but I'm kind of going, okay. Here's 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 our here's our Quiet Man thing, but not because it's it's a lot more violent, you know, uh, you know, and you know. Uh, Conor McGregor was um, over the top. Well, you know, Terry, Terry Funk is more articulate. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, I, he, he, it's, he, he, it's a one note performance. And uh, the yeah, way he's yeah. walking, I'm going, well, either th there's a reason, you know, because he's, he's like he's just gotten off a horse. 
you know, and he's got that <laughs> kind of you know, swagger and we got a lot of, uh, you know, so that's the nudity. I, I was hoping for <laughs> something else, but I'm also kind of looking going, I should either see something hanging down or one just assumes that he's, you know, uh, constantly erect, I guess. I don't <laughs> know. That's not what I want to be thinking about when I'm watching this movie. That's not the final thing <laughs> I want from Roadhouse. You know what? Oh, <laughs> I've heard a lot of reviews and comments, but I had not heard that one. That's a good one. <laughs> well, that's how my mind works. But um, well, you know, I just, I, I found... I, I found that it, it lacked the character development. Um, I think Jake, you know, really worked hard, obviously, um, you know, and he certainly committed to the role. Uh, I just think they, they, they missed a bet by not surrounding him with more, more characters that we could care about who care about him. Um, you know, it, uh, it, 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 it kind of, you, you always look for an arc in a character and it kind of, um, made made it hard for him to have very much of an arc and leave very much of an impression you know um and then he kind of disappears on the bus and they find the money because i kept wondering i <laughs> where'd that boat go that boat that he yeah. sent out with yeah. all the money all these little things that you're going um i i don't i don't want to be distracted i want i want to stay in the story here but you know and you know, and where's Big Daddy? You know, if Big Daddy's the guy from the prison, you know, it, we never see him. It's not like, um, have you? Did you see the series, The Gentleman? Not yet. Um, uh, Lee, you have, right? It's quite good. Uh, I I like the movie very much. I was on was on, on my last location. They, I got one channel, and I ended up watching it a couple of times because it was the only thing worth watching. <laughs> um, Matthew McConaughey did a, did a fun thing, and it's a Guy Ritchie movie, one of his better ones, and I, I really quite liked it. So when the series came out, we watched that a couple of weeks ago, and I went, oh, this is, you know, you know really Series, I, yeah, I hear that's good. Uh, yeah. But it has, um, oh, I'm trying to think what is, uh, very funny. He basically plays, um, you know, the triple agent in Crystal Skull. I can't think of his name offhand. Um, you know, the English actor, he's, 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 he's Ray he's Weinstone, yeah, Ray Weinstone, yeah, Ray Weinstone, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. great voice, great voice, that's yeah. right. That voice, yeah, it's kind, kind of, you know. <laughs> um, but you know, he's he's in prison, except you know, he's uh, uh, it's certainly a white collar prison and he has all of the things, but they keep coming back and and referencing him, and he's useful because you're you're right, the you know, the son of the and. It's not really clear why they're fighting for this particular, you know, piece of real estate. Um, you know, with uh, in the original Ben Gazzara, you know, it's Ben Gazzara and his ego and controlling the town. Yeah, and he owns the town, so yeah. yeah this is my point. town. You know, and yeah. the other you've got you've got this. Well, I'm here, and I didn't tell you the truth about this, but you know, there's this, and my family built this, and okay, that's those are all words, but you know, where's where's what is it that is making you work so hard that we should care about the fact that we don't want to see you lose your bar? Um, and what yeah. is it about this particular piece of real estate that, you know, if, if we'd found out earlier that I'm trying to, you know, build Mar-a-Lago Mar or whatever. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely one of the I kind of like, mm, why are they doing this? Anyway, yeah. so it, um, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I wanted I, to uh, a lot of more emotional attachment to the original. Of course, you know, I, <laughs> I like that catch <laughs> guy. He was really good. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity uh, and you've given us so much time here and we don't want to uh, monopolize your, uh, your holiday here. But I wanted to uh, kind of let you uh, um, give any uh, final insights to your experience on working on the original roadhouse. Cause it's, it's such a fan favorite it's such a rewatchable film too. And one of the things that we celebrate here on couch potato theater is the rewatchability of these films. And this is definitely one of those. Oh, uh, yes, it is. And, you know, and thank you. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a collaboration. I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of, uh, it was a very good experience. There's, you know, I have, I have no negative, um, um, <laughs> you know, um, the, there were there were lots i you know I, I was i was there you know i was there for pretty much everything um you know we uh the first stuff we shot was at um uh, ben bazaar's mansion which was up in uh, uh 
oh shoot, Bakersfield, you know, off, off of that. Uh, <laughs> I bought a pair of boots <laughs> that, uh, you know, I then wore for the next several years anyway. So those were my roadhouse boots. But, um, you know, that, that location, um, you know, the burning of the, uh, the stables, I had to laugh, the, uh, the pyro guy, uh, his name was Aldo. Uh, he worked on, um, uh, predator. Um, you know, and he told me stories about smuggling explosives and debt cord, you know, across the border in a car, you know, and hoping <laughs> that they could get a spark and, you know, blow them all up. Um, but, you know, I, that they'd had, they'd had to clear a road. They were down in the jungles and he got out some of the dead cord and wrapped it around the fallen tree and blew, blew them the doorway, you know, the drive through. But he, um, you know, when they were burning the, uh, you know, the cabin where, you know, across the lake from uh, where Ben Gazar lived, and, you know, was watching it, uh, they, you know, they had said it, but, you know, the, to have the continuity of having the same level of flame, he had Ziploc bags full of gasoline. So he would go and lob these, you know, bags of gasoline and Ziploc bags of gasoline onto the fire. Would, okay, we're ready to go again. Okay, boom. And he'd throw a couple of bags and the flames would shoot up and they would roll. <laughs> you know, I, I remember Patrick, um, you know, he did that. It was, it was a very practical stunt. Um where and you know patrick <laughs> as we all do uh, the the injuries are cumulative over the years i mean i've uh, I've, I've replaced two hips and uh, uh which have been great it gave me a new lease on life but I, i'd rather wear parts out than have them rust but he um you know he was uh, had a leg injury that he was kind of nursing but he still did that i watched him do a full out sprint and bulldog uh, um uh, shoot uh marshall teague you know off his motorcycle <laughs> yeah mm, yeah you know yeah he, he actually went flying you know into some pads but then they put the two together and you did that and they did the fight uh, there is there is a story that was fairly uh apocryphal because after their fight scene they're both limping around for a couple of days and um supposedly somebody had whispered in uh uh <laughs> patrick's here marshall thinks you're a pussy you know so uh they were, they were putting a little more into those kicks than they really needed to they, you know they, they gave that fight a lot of coverage and um you know so they'd shot all that before we came back and we were actually shooting um do you know where uh, melody ranch is in um canyon country no, not familiar with that one. Well, it's a uh, it, it's a movie ranch, and it's they've shot movies. You know, they've shot westerns there since like the uh, the TV westerns from the fifties. Okay. And they, they've shot all kinds of stuff there, but it's you know it's it's not too far from where I live actually. But they they had gotten this. Um, it's a parking lot for uh, they would have a cowboy poetry festival and and stuff every year. Um, it's one of the parking lots, and they built the double deuce there. It's really a circus tent. Um, you know, so the interior is inside of the tent and then the exterior is, you know, the facade, which went from being kind of clunky to, you know, <laughs> the beautiful uh, double deuce, you know, with the neon and again, all that vibrancy of color, you know, of course, watching the girl get out of the, uh, low slung car and, you know, high heel her way to the door, that's production value, but, uh, <laughs> and they had the, um, you know, reds, you know, auto parts store about maybe a hundred feet away, you know, which they burned to the ground. But uh, the, the, the bar itself was you came in, you know, past the facade and you were in a, essentially like a big circus tent. Um, so that was, that was the interior of the bar, but uh, that was pretty cool. But when he dragged me outside, he'd, he'd come off of this big fight with uh, Marshall, you know, and they'd kind of, you know, healed up and they weren't, weren't limping too much anymore. <laughs> and, um, they came out and, um, Patrick was, uh, you know, we were having our fight and everything, and uh, and he had this. Um, I said, Patrick, I like a little contact, you know, I don't mind, you know, accuse me, and it's just fine, but please stop hitting me under the manubrium. And he was doing these uppercuts into, um, you know, my solar plexus, and you know, and coming up, I said, you can hit me, but please stop doing that. <laughs> and he went, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. You know, and when we did our thing, and then the last thing I know, he's going to kick me, and it, well, you know, and I'm you know, boom, and you know, just just brushing the top of his hair as uh, you know, as as we're doing our fight and stuff like this, and it went really well. And then I know he's going to kick me, and I'm going, 
well, I, I have a lot of respect for Patrick, but I'm still going to cover myself, you know, so that he kicks my arm and not the side of my head. Uh, that, that little bit, you son of a bitch. That was an ad lib, you know, at the time. But, um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> what was nice was after, after that sequence, Patrick said, geez, I love working with you, man. It's like dancing. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. That it's is good. awesome. Oh, so wow. uh, I had a very good time and it, um, uh, you know, and, and I think, I think the effort by, and creativity by everybody, you know, it was definitely a team effort at every level on both sides of the camera. And I think it shows on screen. And that's, that's fun. That's why it lasts. That is fantastic insight. I, I knew you were going to do that. I love that. I, I wanted you to give the audience a chance to kind of uh, let them know how to reach out to you, uh, maybe for some future training, uh, anything else that you would like to share uh, regarding that? Um, yes, and, uh, indeed. Uh, if there's <laughs> if there's something I know and you want to learn it, I will find a way to teach it to you. Um, and you know, I tell people if you commit to me, I will commit to you. My wife doesn't let me work for free, but um, you know, <laughs> we, we we do what we can to uh, you know accommodate people. Um, I can speed your learning curve. Um, I can teach you some things that if you work in the business uh, as an actor or as an action actor or a stunt man, I can give you things that uh, are based on 50 years of my, you know, and I'm, I'm always, I'm still, I train, I train every day. I'm learning and teaching and sharing. Um, I, I enjoy it, you know, so, uh, and I enjoy sharing useful things with other people to help them make the most of their, you know, character and story action opportunities. Um, check out my website, which is my last name.com www.delongis.com. You can pretty much get everywhere there. It uh, shows, you know, my front of the camera, behind the camera, voice work. Also uh, all of my, um, uh, all of my training instructionals are now online on a thing called buy me a coffee. So you can download it. So you can have it on your phone. So if you're training, you consult it. And then you can, uh, there's private training at Rancho and Dollar. So, um, you know, reach out and, uh, we can start a conversation. Uh, for those of you, uh, listening to the audio podcast too, that's going to be in the show notes that information and, uh, uh, also on the uh, the YouTube uh, notes as well. Uh, Anthony, I uh, want to say thank you so much on behalf of uh, uh, my my guest here, co-host. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insight on this film. It means the world to us. Oh, you're welcome, guys. It was it was a lot of fun. Uh, let's let's do this again. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, now you, every, uh, again, uh, enjoy the rest of your holiday here. And uh, we're not done with the show, though. We're going to still uh, uh, talk about some of the segments of this uh, wonderful cool. movie and uh, let you get back to Mary. Tell Mary we said hi, by the way. And oh, well. happy anniversary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Happy, happy anniversary. anniversary. Happy birthday. Give me a call, Lee. You know, and congratulations. Will do, sir. Good. Yeah, right. uh, you'll be hearing from some weirdos and learning our Minnesota accent here pretty soon. <laughs> hey, hey there, I'm going to kick your butt. <laughs> we'll bring some cheese with you when you come. <laughs> there, bud. All right, guys. He's priming you. He's teasing you. He's getting you ready. Thank you, Anthony. See you later. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, that was great, guys. That was really, really cool. Uh, I want to thank you, thank Anthony again for coming on and uh, uh, sharing some awesome behind the scenes story on Roadhouse. And it, please, and I'm a proud owner of one of his Bullwhip videos too. Uh, look into that if that's what you're interested. And uh, they really do make you feel at home on Rancho and in, in, uh, in Ballo. There, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful location. Uh, but we're not done with our podcast, guys. Here, we got some other stuff to, to get into. And uh, I've, we've got some new segments, of course, that we want to share with you. But I did want to give you a quick uh, um, opportunity to let me know. First of all, I'm going to start with you, Lacey. Yeah. Uh, when you were re-watching this recently, how did you rewatch it? And when did you first see it? Uh, well, I watched it recently on my Blu-ray. But when I watched the sequel or the reboot, I did see that it is available on um, Prime. Uh, it, it was on Prime um, as a backup matter of fact when i finished the first one it actually like i mean when i finished the new one it actually cycled right into the original uh with uh, swayze so um but i uh i remember i mean a million years i don't think i was allowed to go see this i think i think that my parents were like no it's a little bit too because i think i was like 15 maybe 
I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw it anyway. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, at the theater, I don't know. I mean, it was just kind of one of those things. Um, okay. But yeah, um, what was the rest of it? Just where and when, right? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to know uh, when, when you first originally saw it and uh, how you saw it recently. Lee, Lee what about you? Uh, did you watch it recently and where and when did you first see this? Um, I watched it on um, Amazon because my DVD was scratched to all hell. Oh, no. But but the original time I watched it uh, was, I believe, on HBO uh, in my parents' basement. Uh, my sister uh, said, you got to see this movie. And I'm like, oh, it's the Dirty Dancing guy. I don't really care. And then suddenly I'm like, oh, there's a lot of boobs in this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for years I called this Dirty Bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> which has so many in, multiple entendres in, in this movie. But, uh, yeah. Uh, and it's one, uh, when I was fighting for the University of Iowa, uh, we would watch this before tournaments along with uh, Best of the Best, also celebrating an anniversary this year. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah. Let me switch um, uh, audio here. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Kyle, what about you? Uh, where did you watch it recently, and when did you foresee uh, Roadhouse? I, I watched my uh, digital copy that I own on iTunes. Um, I originally saw this. It was it was home video. Um, I just did not stay in the theaters long enough when I, when I lived in Alaska to get a chance to go see it in the theater. But yeah, this this was this was a regular rental from Blockbuster back in the day. Um, yeah, this is this is an all time classic, and it, to re, even to revisit it. And I also do uh, one of the few things I do still own on physical media because it has a great commentary on the Blu Ray version I have by Kevin Smith. But um, yeah, as far as watching it recently, it was my digital copy that I purchased on iTunes. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I ended up purchasing it on iTunes as well, even though I had the uh, um, the, the Blu-ray, uh, which also has some commentaries I need to get to. But uh, I was just like, you know, this too, this movie's too, this movie's too good to not have it in all formats, you know, especially if you're on the road somewhere and you want to pop it up digital. I, I purchased on digital as well, but it is streaming on, I think, Paramount Plus. If I remember correctly, uh, so make sure you guys check that out if you if you have that as well. Uh, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to talk about uh, some of your favorite lines uh, in the film. It's got a lot of good ones. I'm just going to start off with some two quick ones here. Vodka rocks. What do you say we get nipple to nipple? <laughs> and uh, when uh, uh, I think it's Terry says, I know I heard you had big balls big enough to come in a dump truck, but you don't look like much to me. <laughs> One of my favorites. Uh, Lee, Lee, you got a favorite uh, quote? Well, I was first going to say, like, I don't think she could go nipple to nipple. I think they were way too big and probably too far apart to, like, I, <laughs> the physics don't work there. They're, they're impressive, but I don't think she could have done it. Um, but uh, what was the line? Uh, Does a hobby horse have a wooden dick? Yes. <laughs> um, That's one of my favorites one. is... Hey, I'm in a real class act joint. We have to put a sign in the bathroom that says, don't eat the big white mint. <laughs> That's a good, uh, and, That's a good uh, couple. You know, I've got to wonder uh, exactly who thought it was a great idea to say what that guy did to guys like him in prison. Cause that's just a, right? yeah, like, okay. Uh, yeah. I think that guy, yeah. Rip, rip his throat out. That's a good thing. And it's not a line, but I realized in re rewatching this uh, for a great Buick call uh, Big T. Uh, and I'm wondering, because he bought a Buick, like in the next scene, <laughs> did he call that number? And that's actually where you get a Buick. <laughs> somebody had just been <laughs> undoing the graffiti. Kyle, do you have any lines? Um, the line about uh, a certain word being two nouns put together to elicit a response. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. And well, what what if he calls my mother a whore? Is she? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's all it's all in the delivery with that. Lacey, what about you? You got a line? Well, I mean, of course, it's be nice until it's time to not be nice. Uh, it's kind of the classic. Um, I do still love the thing about you know when he says, um, uh, no, I don't fly. It's too dangerous because it, it just. It seems so silly for someone who gets stabbed on a regular basis. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what was it she when she was in the the doctor's telling you know listing off his list of of injuries and you're just like and he's afraid of flying? 
Yeah, oh, what's yeah. more dangerous there? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, every time somebody looks at him, they say, I thought you'd be bigger, which is, you know, just yeah. kind of fun. Kyle? I, I just wanted to add, too, I think it's two of the greatest introduct how a character is introduct introduced is when Jeff Healy is on stage and introduces Dalton after the fight scene. And then how, he does the same thing later with uh, Wade Garrett. Or not Wade, uh, uh, Samuel Lance's character. Mm -hmm. Right. Wade Garrett, yeah. 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 And and how and how he and just how he says it, it just has that extra coolness because it's Jeff Healy. That's mm -hmm. Dalton there, everyone. And then, yeah, and then he, yeah. it almost looks like he looks back and goes, "You, you ass, what are you saying that for? Why are you, why are you calling me out?" Um, the, only one, the only thing missing is your ass. Yeah, <laughs> there's that's what makes this movie great. Is there's so many quotables, but but I wanted to give some love to uh, the cast here. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, there's so many colorful characters, but we got to start with director Ra Rowdy Harrington, of course. Uh, we've also, of course, got uh, Mr. Patrick Swayze himself. Um, we also got uh, um, Kelly Lynch here. Some great scenes. Uh, and Sam Elliott, guys. I mean, let's hear it for Sam Elliott in that hair. Yeah, uh, like one of the greatest. Heads uh, hold on, Lacey. Ever. You okay? You going to be okay there, Lacey? Sam Elliott. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> we got Ben Gazzara as Brad Wesley. I just tell me, I think he should have just gone by his real name because that sounds a little more scary than Brad Wesley. I just thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, we have, we've got also uh, one of the really good bad guys in this movie as well, man. Uh, uh, sure, I'm forgetting his name. What's his name? What's his name? Um, that... Marshall. Something. Marshall Teague as Jimmy. There we go. Sorry, I can't forget Marshall Teague is is. is me there uh and we got some other great characters of course we have uh julie michaels as denise guys did you know that she's actually a stunt woman yeah. and mm -hmm. she's so good at her job she can do some acting and of course she of course is uh well julie michaels as denise so yeah she's great in this film uh, we got some other uh love to show here to the cast uh we've got some people here, the guy that we own that owns the bar here. Uh, we've got uh, what's his name is uh, Kevin Ty is Frank, mm -hmm. and we also have uh, Kathleen Wilhoyt as Carrie. We got Red Red West as Red Webster, okay, and Shun Sunshine Parker as Emmett. Love him. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, Kyle, we've got of course the Jeff Healy here playing Cody. And then uh, we've got some of the uh, other characters uh, that round out the caster. John Doe is Pat McGurn. Travis McKenna is Jack. You mentioned him earlier, right, Lee? Travis McKenna. Yeah, he's uh, been in a couple movies with Anthony. He was uh, one of the clowns in Batman Returns. Uh, he's been in another mm. movie with uh, Robert uh, Chapin, who we've mentioned previously on uh, Blood of Kings. But I just noticed that he's been in uh, several movies with both of them, and I was just wondering if there's a friendship there. So, Good point. That's a great point, yeah. Uh, okay, guys, I got it. Kyle, I got to bring this up because you, this is one of the new segments here at uh, Couch Potato Theater is, do you think we need one more? Is there an actor, actress, do you think that should have been in this film? I'm going to throw mine out real too. I, I, I like these two guys. You may have heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> I like these guys. I'm going to go with uh, Michael Ironside or Robert Dobby. I, I wanted there to be another bad guy that connected Brad Wesley to the outside. Because Brad Wesley is a powerful man, but I think he has some influence on the outside. And I think that someone just a little bit higher, a little more uh, would have been good to have in there. Kyle, you got somebody? This is actually going interesting because I'm actually going with somebody who was in this movie who was supposed to have a much bigger role in this movie. And it got completely cut out. And that is the legendary Keith David. Apparently, he Keith even has a, fight, he has a fight scene with Patrick Swayze's Dalton in this film that's supposed to be outstanding is this keith david in. or david keith keith uh, david, <laughs> keith david. He, ha he has a whole arc that was in this film that was actually a fairly good sized arc and it got completely cut because the runtime was so long at that point yeah uh anyone else gotta throw for a second i'm gonna a second kyle like okay you you get you got the man there like let's let's use it you know that's good point yeah, I mean, if we got yep. Keith David there, we got to have Roddy Roddy Piper. Could you imagine him clearing out that bar? Can you imagine having two Roddies working on this film? Yeah. <laughs> Roddy Roddy. So, yeah. Also, <laughs> I think uh, we need to just bring in that era's Mel Gibson because I think only he had the mullet 
that could have given uh, <laughs> Sam and Patrick a run for their money. I tried yeah. to push mine out a little bit. But uh, Kyle, Kyle, did you have a question? No, I was just going to say, and of course, Danny Trejo would just compliment anybody like that. <laughs> That's a young Trejo. That's like, yeah, actually, he, he might have still been incarcerated. He's still pretty old. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's another fun one here, guys. We call this the uh, Indiana, we, we call this the, uh, um, the who else could have been Indiana Jones in this one? And, uh, you know, it's the Tom Selleck was Indiana Jones because he was, he was cast. But then Magnum PI producer says, nope, and yanked him out. So we had some other people that could have been in this. And of course we have, and that Benning was originally cast as Dr. Elizabeth Clay. However, the role was recast because she and Patrick Swayze had too little chemistry and she was replaced by Kelly Lynch. I find that hard to believe, but yeah, uh, she's a wonderful uh, actress. But also Scott Glenn turned down the role of Jimmy Reno, who eventually went to Marshall Teague. Can you imagine... Scott Glenn in this? Hell yeah. <laughs> Except he wouldn't have okay, needed Patrick so, so. Swayze. He would have been just kicking all the asses himself. <laughs> this is true. So, two things. I th honestly think the Kelly Lynch casting, because of the look Kelly ha Lynch has for this that area of the country and for what it is, is works really well. And with, with Scott Glenn, the problem is Jimmy had that kind of smug thing going on and i think that works better i, I don't get smug from scott you glenn. believe jimmy had prison time scott glenn we don't we don't believe yeah. that yet so yeah that's yeah. a good point but we, we've seen, <laughs> scott glenn seen some things but he hasn't yeah, had yeah, prison yeah. Time. <laughs> all right we have some other fun categories here for the new couch potato theater here and one of them i've been looking forward to talking about is the types of vehicles we call this the fast or not so furious favorite mode of transportation and i got some on the board here for you guys of course we've got bigfoot here we've talked about it here with anthony uh, at the top of the show probably the uh the the surefire winner here bigfoot seven and it, it has some great moments obviously but I want to throw out a couple other options. My personal favorite is the 1965 Buick Riviera with the working headlights. Absolutely love this car. I love the fact that he also throws in some new set of tires right away because you kind of get an idea of what's happening. And I got a picture here, uh, too, of a more recent uh, uh, fixed up one here. But I just think that's a beautiful car. It's, it's uh, we also got headlights. what's that, Kyle? It's all about the headlights. Yeah. Uh, and then we, we also got, of course, the, the other car, the 87 Mercedes Benz, which Patrick Swayze from his, from this, uh, bought this from the studio when he had finished filming it. So he got attached to this thing here. Uh, but I want to give, uh, your thoughts on your favorite vehicles in this movie. Lacey, I'm going to start with you. Bigfoot. Bigfoot. I mean, Bigfoot it is. I'm like, <laughs> love, love monster trucks. Like, yep. have a thing. It's it's. A I, I feel like they haven't been utilized as well, and we need to bring them back in films. I feel like we need to see yeah. more of that. But Kyle, this, what about you? Oh, sorry, Lacey. No, I was just gonna say, like, this is one of those things that definitely identifies this as a straight up '80s flick. Yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that. Yeah, we'll touch on that later. Uh, yeah. Kyle, what about you? What's your favorite vehicle in this? Uh, I, I'm like you. I got to go with the Buick, but you got always got to have some spe some special love for Bigfoot too. Even you know you notice in this particular version of Bigfoot, it doesn't. They don't even have it have any of these decals or paint that Bigfoot normally has. But you just know it. Yeah, I I think that uh, the character that Anthony was playing uh, in a cut scene. I'm thinking this like, hey man, you know you, you you own this town. How about we come in with a Bigfoot? He's like, let's get it. You know. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Lee, are you with us here? That looks like we lost Lee for a second. We'll bring him back. Uh, okay, the next category that is kind of fun here, guys, and and you know we got to we got to call this the Zoolander. They look so hot right now. Favorite costume or fashion moment? And uh, I want to start off here and go with Kelly here. That who else can pull off a picnic blanket? Picnic, um, <laughs> you know, cloth dress. Yes. Yeah. Who else can pull that off? That is her. She can definitely pull that off. And I want to give a shout out, of course, to this, you know, the pleated slack, high-waisted look, of course, that uh, that we have here going with um, uh, Patrick Swayze. And Miss Miss Michaels here with uh, that white dress, which is so 80s, guys. But I wanted you uh, guys to uh, uh, throw out your bid for your favorite fashion moment. Lacey, start with you. 
just everyone who has the shoulder pads. There are so <laughs> many shoulder pads. Every like and the dresses. There's there's one the one scene where like everyone comes running out and they're watching the big scene where um uh where Anthony's about to get his nose broken and he's like you you know you broke my nose or whatever and like they show back like just the door. There's one woman who comes out right behind um uh, uh, somebody yeah. and, and yeah, yeah. The, the sleeves are like I mean they're like. It's 80s. It is a oh, 80s was all about extending yeah, yeah, extending this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From the shoulder. And it yeah. goes to her wrist, not to yep. her elbow, to her wrist. Oh yeah. That that, that yeah, that, that says 80s. Now, Kyle, what about you? You got you got some uh mentions of uh, fashion? I, I gotta agree with you on the picnic dress. Um yeah, only <laughs> Kelly Lynch pull, is is pulling that off. Patrick Swayze trying to bring like I don't kind of like the urban style Miami vice to Jasper, Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Well point Lacey. But I will say that I don't understand doing the, the martial or like the training, the Tai Chi that he was doing. He wears the tightest sweatpants. Like what is the point of having sweatpants that tight? Sweatpants are supposed to be flowy. And I, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, we got to see his ass, bare ass. And right, we want so to make no sure that. To do the, the, yeah. <laughs> it was like, All right. mm, yep. All right, guys. Uh, next is the Harry met Sally scene, the best scene or moment between two characters. And my vote is of course, the scene that you were just talking about, Lacey, not necessarily about, his uh, his his behind, of course, mm -hmm. but I love the where he's fighting his angst here. He's taking it out on uh, this punching bag in his um, hundred dollar a month rented barn, and this is where we kind of get the reality check because um, Dalton's friend, uh, played by Sam here, realizes what's coming, mm -hmm. and I just I absolutely love this scene. Uh, what about you, Kyle? Do you have a favorite scene between uh, two two people? Um, uh, that's a, that is one of my favorites in this movie too, but I actually, um, really like the scene where it's, um, Patrick and Sam Elliott's characters sitting there, um, at the diner with Kelly Lynch had excused herself and he's talking to him about how he's got to let Memphis go. Yeah. And yeah. That's just, you're, you're getting a little bit more insight to the Dalton character and what the thing that haunts him. And I think that was a really poignant scene. Lee, you're back with us. Can you hear us? Okay. Uh, Lee, are you still? You what's up? Lee's having a connection problem here. Uh, Lacey, do you have a uh, moment, best moment between two characters in this movie? Um, yes, I would say. Well, between two humans, it would be uh, when Carrie brings breakfast that first day, and she just like straight up ogles him as he gets out of bed naked. That's hilarious. But uh, that might be seen between three people because you got her, you got Pat, Patrick, and his butt. So I'm just saying. Yeah. Right. That's fair. <laughs> also. Either, Tinker versus the polar bear thing. Absolutely hilarious. Just that very last sign where he's like, we'll get to that. We'll get to that one in a little bit too. Lee, can you, are you with us back now? You, you, yes, you... I am. I'm All having right, the worst connections today. Well, let's, let's stay on your phone here. We were uh, talking about your favorite moment between two characters with our segments here. I mean, I think it comes down to four words or five words. I don't have $20. <laughs> I mean, way to way way to sell the the next uh, category here, Lee, and that is Salt and Peppa. Let's talk about sex or best romance scene. And Lee brought up one sort of, but I'm gonna I got throw out the Kelly Lynch and uh, Patrick Swayze love scene. I mean, come on, they end up going outside on that deck that you know people can see from across the way. Uh, am I missing something else, guys? <laughs> I'm just going to go back to the Tinker versus the Polar Bear. All right. We'll, we'll okay. come back. Uh, just a side note on that particular scene when the, they had to put a special padding on the wall when he's because there was that stone wall in that cabin and it was causing problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Okay. Well, the next category, Lee, we need you for this one. This is the best fight scene here. Uh, and we got some options in this one. There's there's some really, really good ones here. And I just want to throw some out there. Of course, we got the end scene um, between, of course, uh, Dalton and Jimmy. The uh, I effed you guys uh, like you in prison. And then, of course, leads to the throat rip. We've got that one. 
Uh, we've also got, of course, when uh, Jimmy is first introduced and his fighting skills, he's got the pull cue, and that needs to be broken up by a gunshot to uh, the ceiling. And, of course, we got the fight at the end there with uh, Ben Gazzara, um, uh, Brad's house, and several people get it there as well. But, Lee, I wanted to get your thoughts on your favorite uh, fight scene. Uh, straight up, when uh, Wade Garrett shows up and just kind of like, how you doing, mijo? And everyone's just still beating his ass. Get out of here, Dad. <laughs> You want to fight niggas? Well, I ain't going to show you my dick. <laughs> like, it's just the perfect, like, cowboy bouncer uh, crazy moment. I absolutely loved it. I also want to say my the best mode of transportation is a hot blonde picking you up in a red Jeep. Oh, there, my you know, God. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well said. Win. <laughs> I love the 65 Riv, but Kelly Lynch shows up. I'm leaving the Riv in the parking lot. Yeah, that woof, good point there. Yeah, and uh, Lacey, we know that Bigfoot is the worst possible stakeout car. Like, <laughs> they're just like watching, trying to be secret. And it's like there's two stories above every car in the parking lot, watching, laughing. They're wearing bright blue clothes, like, they are the dumbest possible. The only people dumber are Patrick Swayze and Kelly Lynch who don't see them. <laughs> Lacey, uh, real, we got to gotta do this kind of a little, uh, um, uh, a little faster rounds here, guys. Uh, Lacey, did you have a best fight scene? I just like the very the, when they're when he's first kind of nodding at people and letting them take it like take care of it themselves. I, I enjoyed the not, not so much the fighting of it, but just the <laughs> how it kind, of, how it kind of grew you know, when he was teaching the guys how to be nice until it was time to not be nice. I thought that was kind of a good progression. <laughs> uh, Kyle, what about you? F favorite fight scene? Uh, it's it's got to be the fight in, in the double dudes, which when Jimmy really kind of get we see just how bad bad Jimmy is. I mean, but the, across yeah. more because you got you got Jimmy fighting Sam Elliott, you got Jimmy fighting Dalton, you've got all kinds of things going on. You see a little bit of everything happening there. Hey okay, Kyle, uh, this one's inspired by you. The next segment here, uh, this is called the "You Took Him Out with What?" Favorite weapon or inanimate object used as a weapon. Uh, you. <laughs> And this is where, of course, that we're going to talk about, ah, uh, Tingle here gets taken out by the polar bear. But uh, did anyone have any other honorable mentions of uh, weapons used? Uh, Lee, I'm going to go with you here. I mean, you really got to go with uh, the skinning knife that uh, uh, Tinker stabs him with in the first fight in the office. Uh, got to love that one. Um, you know, just in general, I think... Um, Ramping a Mercedes at six people is a pretty good weapon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd definitely give that one up too. Uh, what about you, Kyle? You got to give the high marks for the use of liquor bottles as weapons in this movie. I, I mean, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like they're just hanging around. Scene. They're all there, you know? So, I mean, yeah. I mean, you gets knocked over the head with like a full bottle at one point. Is No. <laughs> Lacey, is Tinker getting taken out by the polar bear? Is this your vote? I do. I do love that. I, I will say that I'm a big fan of like just a solid look, pull cue to the back of the noggin. Like there the you, oh, that's a good one. That's a good that's one. A solid yeah. bar fight tool. Yeah. We've touched on this earlier, uh, especially with Ant Anthony DeLongis' uh, uh, scene here. But this is the Sean Bean Award for the best, best death scene. And of course, uh, you know... Got to mention Anthony again. First of all, he gets stabbed with his own knife, and then uh, Patrick uses uh, him as a human shield after he throws his knife at this bad guy, and uh, Anthony gets shot in the back. Uh, but, of course, we've got two that I'd like to nominate. The throat rip, obviously, and um, then his body gets paraded in the water there. And then, of course, <laughs> Brad Wesley gets shotgun to death by basically everyone. Uh, Lee, your favorite death scene here. I mean, you got to go with uh, Ben Gazzara just getting shot four times while trying to get one shot off. I mean, uh, I wish we would have had a Sam Elliott death scene because that would have taken the cake. But yeah, just you just kind of cut. Screen. You see the you see the you see him afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Lacey, what about you? Your favorite death scene? That's what I was gonna say. Was the Sam Elliott like even though we didn't see the death when he rolls him over and the sign the paper says it was tails that just shows how little this person was worth in that guy's eyes. Yeah. I think that takes the cake over all the other actual like visual death scenes for me. Good point. Kyle. Uh, I agree with what Lacey said about the Sam Elliott, but I think the Brad Wesley death scene is one of the most satisfying death scenes in, <laughs> in, in 80s films. <laughs> I 
because you, he's you just you want to see him get his, and he does. Yeah, it's, he does definitely, definitely. Our next category here, guys, and uh, this is a fun one here. This is the Kenny Loggins or John Williams best use of music or song in this film. And uh, I'm going to just go ahead and give my favorite anything by the Jeff Healy band, especially the outro song. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, when the night comes. It's just a great, great tune. But I do have a runner up the opening band here, guys, uh, the Crusados. Uh, and they were formed in 1983 and lead singer Tito uh, Laveria. He was also in the other band that you may remember called Tito and the Tarantula in From Dusk Till Dawn. Uh, Lee, your favorite music scene uh, or moment uh, in this movie? I mean, you got to go with Roadhouse Blues, especially in a movie called Roadhouse. But uh, yeah. I mean, Tito and the Crusados there, like that's, uh, I swear, that looks so much like uh, if Ronnie James Dio had a lounge act. That's what it reminded me of. And in the top right corner of the dance screen, that dude was on all the coke he could find to dance that way. It was <laughs> like, why are you there, dude? There are cute chicks. We already looked at several of their butts and boobs. Like, we don't need you, you know, shaking it like a sack full of axe handles up there, bud. Well, you know, what's interesting is that uh, the Crusados, uh, they contributed three songs to the film, but they never made the soundtrack. And there's a lot of songs that don't make the soundtrack. Uh, including there's some Patrick Swayze uh, tunes on here as well. Uh, Kyle, what's your favorite moment of music in this movie? Uh, it's anything with the Jeff Healy band. I'm still, you know, just shaking my head at the fact Anthony DeLonge and all those actors just got to sit around and listen to him jam. Right? On set. I, Jeff Healy just there hanging out in between takes, jamming. And, my God. And, and yeah. In my opinion, to one of the greatest guitar players ever. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, this magic yeah Lacey, what about you um i i was just actually looking through scrolling through the uh to to take a look at it um i i loved all the music by the band i just don't know any of the actual names of them so i, I just it just i like the band um the jeff healy band so i couldn't tell you one name of one song though kyle uh, just real quick point i want to throw out i want to throw it out earlier that's one of the big things too between the original Roadhouse and the remake. Not to knock the musicians in the new Roadhouse, but this music is magic. Oh it god, is, yeah, you know? it is. It is really, really good. Yeah, and I, I do recommend the soundtrack. It's good. One of the new segments, and by the way, we're not using all of them for this particular Cash Potato Theater. Uh, we're some of them. Uh, we're going to kind of customize uh, to the film that we're watching. But this is one that we definitely had to touch on here. This is called the Star Wars Twin Sons Favorite Filming Location or Set Piece. And Anthony touched on, of course, the double deuce itself and how that was done. Uh, and uh, it's just, especially the inside of it, it's just one of these places like, I don't know about you, maybe Lee can handle himself here, but I'm standing by Lee when I go into a place like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and the other one I wanted to nominate too was, of course, uh, the loft, of Emmett's Barn Loft overlooking the river at Brad Wesley's estate. Fantastic location. Lee, uh, what is your favorite set uh, location in this film? I mean, you really got to give it up to the loft. I mean, we're already big fans of a guy with a loft that has long hair and a weird stream of women and lots of revenge stories. and all. That, that would stuff. be Highlander, the TV series. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, he's got his dojo set up, you know, just like Duncan. Yep. Uh, where he can hit something and then climb a rope and go hit something else, uh, which is, you know, is a good use. Of when you time. say hit something, you mean hit the duffel bag, right? Well, he was hitting the, the board with the uh, seat pads on it, and then he just climbed a rope, and then he hit a duffel bag full of his laundry because he's a small man and he doesn't need a full bag. Lacey is shaking her head because she knew what I was talking about. Lacey, what is your favorite set, set piece or, uh, um, you, you know, know film I gotta say, like all the main set, sets are fantastic, but when it comes to uh, the fact that he, uh, Anthony was saying that they had built Reds across the street, or you know, a hundred yards away, and I'm looking at it, and the, just the the amount of of like just stuff inside there, it was it, it was, as far as like set design. Yeah. That was a great set. I mean, it was only had two scenes, but it was a it was a great it was a very very specific set. Really well Kyle, the the rebuilt double deuce was nice, so well done. Like, Not yeah, this it, one. It, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah the, 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 it just had a slick design. It popped. I'm like, I bet I'm still like, am I gonna see something like that in Jasper, Missouri? <laughs> <laughs> 
this is a fun one, guys. We got another uh, fun segment here for Couch Potato Theater. And put yourself in the movie here. Uh, and here I got a picture of some lucky um, extra uh, in the scene from Avengers here. Uh, I want to ask you guys, uh, you know, what would you like, what scene do you see yourself in that you would like to be part of? Uh, and uh, one I just got to say is the, the scene with Marshall Teague coming in, uh, threatening everybody with the pull cue. I'd love to be one of these guys in the back. Maybe, you know, maybe maybe a bystander knocked out on the ground with uh, Brad Wesley uh, stopping the fight by shooting his revolver up in the air. Uh, Lee, where, what scene in Roadhouse would you like to be in? Um, I would like to be in that pool party scene with all the naked ladies. <laughs> uh, barring that, I would definitely not like the wet, party. not the wet t-shirt contest, not that one. No, no, that was a wet g-string contest. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> T-shirts were already off. <laughs> uh, Kyle, what about you? Uh, I kind of got to echo these sentiments there, but I would definitely take the bar fight scene with uh, Jimmy as a runner-up. All right, Lacey, what about you? What's what scene would you like to be an extra in in Roadhouse? You, you know, I'm. You know what I'm going to say. I want to be on that car lot like you know buying a car while they run through like that's just awesome i wouldn't be there for the right reason you want to be there for bigfoot i love it i love it <laughs> love it i feel like one of those cars was the family truckster from uh, vacation <laughs> just like it now we're not going to use all the new categories for this because we're going long here so we're going to wrap things up with uh, one of the last categories here and I want to get your guys' thought on this. And so we call this the nuke it from orbit. It's the only way to be sure hot take. And this comes from our uh, our friend of the network who couldn't make it tonight. Alex Autry said something on social media about Roadhouse that I thought was fantastic. And it really made me think. Alex said, Roadhouse is the 80s of all 80s movies. And he listed everything, including Bigfoot, uh, the fights, the nudity, everything. And I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Kyle, is this movie the 80 Can you think of another one? It's in the top three. Um, one that always comes up to mind because of how it is. And even though it's not based in the 80s, but RoboCop. RoboCop is near the top of the 80s of 80s movies. <laughs> what about, that's a good one. Uh, Lacey, what about you? I think this kind of this kind of wraps it, uh, it all into a bow, um, especially if you're talking specifically like action movie. If you wanted to go like adventure, I'd say maybe Goonies, but because everything from the clothing to the you know just it was so 80s. But yeah. um, when it comes to adult feature film, um, Roadhouse really does kind of encompass everything you need for an 80s movie, and the yeah. hair. I mean, the hair, yeah. just the, the, yeah. the, the flowing mane, the mullet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it definitely. Uh, Lee, what about you? Uh, do you think uh, Alex is right? Or do you have another uh, uh, <coughs> when you like to throw in the pool? Um, you know, I think it's got to be neck and neck with the Brad Pack movie. Yeah. You know, St. Saint, Saint Elmo's Fire, Streets of Fire, uh, yeah. you know, Breakfast Club. Uh, you know, I mean, if you go to uh, uh, maybe Weird Science, yeah. you know. But like this one is, I think it's a great exclamation point. I think it 80s as much as possible. Okay. I mean, the Zeke Cavaricci uh, pants that uh, he's wearing throughout to, <laughs> to play a tough guy. And just the sheer amount of money they spent on Moose yeah. that they covered by not spending any money on the hero's underwear. Neither Patrick Swayze, nor Sam Elliott, nor Kelly Lynch wore underwear. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he heck, we get to, we get to see Sam's pubes. I mean, yeah, yeah. You're right. So good call. <laughs> All right, I threw out a contender because one of the most important types of films in the '80s is the high school films, and you touched on that, Lee. Uh, you know, the, the 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 ensemble cast about high school or leaving high school, what would it be? And one of our top five most watched videos that I'm proud to say, guys is the one I did with my wife, Erin, and that is Tough Turf. If you have not seen Tough Turf, I highly recommend you watch it recently because this has all of the 80s tropes that you could ask for. It's got new kid in town causing trouble, having a crush and going out with the bad boy's girl. It's got Robert Downey Jr. in it, uh, and you should see his drumming outfit. And it's got the 80s of the 80s of uh, fashion. It's also got a dance and singing number. And also it's got a main fight at the end 
where someone dies. <laughs> so that's my vote. Just let you guys know. All right. Let's talk about uh, the last segment we're going to touch on here is sequels, prequels, and reboots. Now, Lacey, I'm going to give you uh, the, the heads up on this one because uh, we've talked about the reboot, obviously, but uh, I, it's been a while since I have seen, uh, and this is, of course, oops, let me bring it to the stage here. Roadhouse 2 came out in 2006. Uh, I can't remember the, the lead guy's name, but I know Gary Busey played the ba bad guy. And of course, I think in the film, you hear that uh, Dalton's character has been killed. Lacey, uh, give us a quick little review on your thoughts on Roadhouse 2, because I don't remember it liking it well, but I do want to watch it again. Okay, so it's Shane Tanner, played by uh, Jonathan Sheck. Um, now, from that thing you do. Yes, from that thing you do and several other, yeah. Mm, uh, it, it's, it's, it's almost... It's fun. It's fun watch. It's fun watch for a specific reason. Um, they took the six most quotable lines from the original Roadhouse film. Uh, opinions vary. Uh, flying's too dangerous. Um, thought you'd be taller. Um, oh, just those those six main ones. And then I feel like they built a script around those six lines so that they could do all the things. Um, there are three or four really good actors in this movie. And then there, there it's, it's, there's not, the script does not give them enough to hold on to. So it, it just makes me sad. It just, it's, did, uh, did, did Jake Busey remind you of his father in this movie? Um, he always reminds me of his, I mean, he look, he's a spitting image of his dad. Um, I, I don't, um, I don't think that he, I think that he stands alone in his acting. I think he's a talented mm -hmm. actor. I don't think this script gave him enough. And I think that the way the script was written forced him to almost like overplay it because he was supposed to be this like over the top drug addled kind of like, right. <laughs> Um, which he does really well, but the dialogue made it not as great as it could have been. I the problem I had was knowing that Dalton was killed off right away, knowing that we're not going to see. You know, I hate when they kill people off camera just to do a sequel. I mean, Patrick Swayze was still around. I know he did, probably didn't want to do it, but knowing that his character's dead was my biggest issue with the film. You don't do that. You just say he retired or do something like that. But I hate that trope that they do when they do sequels because they can't get the original cast back. They just yeah. kill them off and mention and stuff like that. That was my yeah. big issue. It story. did kind of come across as like a revenge thing more than yeah. an actual. And and then on top of everything, he like he he's a DEA agent, but he's so he's it's just very there's some, a little bit. There's some disconnects. We'll just say the script was problematic. With that said, I still want to see it again. Absolutely. <laughs> it's definitely a watch for like a drinking game, like get three or four yeah. people around, just sit around, watch it and, and, and just have a good time. It's not it's not something that you're going to, you know, yeah. watch on a Sunday afternoon with your grandparents. Gotcha. Well, guys, uh, this has been an epic cast potato theater. And uh, I just want to first of all, thank Anthony Delon just for coming on. Uh, I appreciate you, sir, for uh, sharing your insight and your memories and your knowledge. Uh, Anthony's just wonderful to hang out with. So thank you very much, Anthony. But I want to uh, give the rest of my crew here your final thoughts on Roadhouse 1989. Kyle, co-founder of the Fandom Podcast Network. We've started this together. You're my brother, best friend. Uh, let's let's have you start first. It's, it's an all-time classic. It's the movie that probably never should have been a classic, but it became one because it, we all just identify with it, some aspect of it one way or the other and it it's it, patrick swayze's everybody in this movie is cool in, in one fact or another patrick swayze's cool sam elliott's cool e, even even and you just have so many quirky characters but it all just came together and worked and come on when your director's name is a rowdy and the movie you're doing is roadhouse i mean that's <laughs> kismet right there <laughs> lee what about you your final thoughts on roadhouse 1989 I mean, I'm a long-haired bouncer that studied philosophy in college. I, I got to love this movie. It's so <laughs> stupid. Th there is no part of this movie that works on paper. Right. That this little dude with a horse face playing the world's toughest bouncer, uh, wearing Z Cavaricis and kicking the crap out of rednecks 
and uh, Ben Gazzara is like the heavy, and you've got you know the weirdest crew of bad guys that have nothing to do with each other, and people tucking their jeans into their boots. Like nobody does that, but <laughs> there's just somehow it's like you know what it's like. It's like that really great greasy burger that you get at a roadside diner that like looks terrible, but it's like one of the best things you've ever eaten. Like it should not be this good. It just is. <laughs> Well said, well said. Lacey, final thoughts on Roadhouse, 1989. I, I think that Lee's very correct, that it, it's kind of like the sum is greater than its parts. It, it's 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 um, it's definitely one to go back and watch every once in a while. It's very much rewatchable for specific reasons, though. This isn't the movie that you, you, you think, oh, I want to see, you know, my top five films of all time. You know, this isn't, uh, but it's just ultimately rewatchable. And I think that it couldn't be made today. That's saying something since they remade it today. <laughs> I mean, the, the things that you would take, that you would have to take out of this movie to make it today are what made it so good back then. So that might be what we've all been struggling to say about the one that's out right now. Yeah, that's a good point. A yeah. Roadhouse movie. It's one of the, yeah, it's, uh, you know, Roadhouse is so iconic now. It is so rewatchable. It's, it, it, what's interesting is that it's one of those films where you can come in any second and then you just get sucked into it. There's no like crappy scenes. There's no dead time. That you're going like, oh, I'm going to look at my phone or bathroom break or whatever. It's just, it is, it is one of the most rewatchable movies of all time with so much character and heart. Uh, when it comes to filmmaking and filmmaking style, they, it's just, it's, it, I don't know if they were expecting it to be as big as it was, but Patrick, Patrick Stewart, I was going to say, <laughs> Patrick okay, Swayze. Yeah, there you go. Recast Patrick Stewart. <laughs> Patrick Swayze, <laughs> Patrick Swayze was at the top of his game. He just done dirty dancing. He has ghosts coming around the corner uh, next to Ken, I think is what he, he did after this. Mm -hmm. And he had a nice little run here. And, uh, you know, depending on who you ask, you, he's got three iconic films uh, that are just, you know, a must see, whether it's, it's ghost uh, dirty dancing or roadhouse. And I like the fact that he's a guy that appeals to everyone. I think too, which is another reason why people like watching this film. So uh, as we wrap things up here, guys, first of all, the fandom podcast network, you can find us on uh, all your podcast catchers. Of course, I want to thank you for the, everyone that was watching and commenting. Thank you guys for doing so. Uh, please uh, find uh, of course us on Facebook and please subscribe to the YouTube channel. We'd appreciate it. And uh, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Um, uh, Lee, give us again, one more time, how people can reach out to you. Well, for a good view, I call 555-0179. Um, otherwise, <laughs> you, can, you can find me on uh, Facebook under my name. Um, I'll soon have a website up, fightmonkeys.com, for uh, the new stunt team, um, as well as the way of the way on Instagram. Um, I'm always up because I'll get enough sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Lacey, how can we find you? Uh, well, I'm here with you guys on several different um, podcasts. And... Uh, Letterboxd is one of my most um, active um, spots. I am on Facebook and X, I think it is, and um, and Instagram, Lacey Pants or The Lacey Pants. Um, so come and find me. Awesome. Hey. Kyle, where can we find you? Uh, oh, Chris, sorry, I'm sorry, real quick, Lee. The Pants. Are the lazy. Pants, yes. <laughs> Kyle, where can we find you? Of course, you can find me all over the place on the Fandom Podcast Network. Of course, uh, too, you can find me on Twitter at a Kyle W or on Instagram and thre threads at a Kyle Fandom. I'm going to go hang out at the Double Deuce now. Um, hopefully, there's no eyeballs to sweep up. Well, don't just hang out at the Double Deuce, but don't take a Double Deuce. So just watch that. Okay? So um, <laughs> that took a lot. I just made Lacey cringe. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's the cringeworthy moment of the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. There you go. Uh, my name is my name is Kevin. You can find me on uh, uh, on all the main um, uh, social medias at Spartan underscore Phoenix. Uh, of course, you know X, Instagram, uh, Threads, and of course on Letterbox. Uh, anyway, I want to thank uh, my guest. Thank, of course, uh, Lacey. Thank you so much, uh, Lee. 
appreciate you. And of course, Kyle, and again, our special guest, Anthony Delongis. Thank you so much. Lacey, you are holding up a fantastic documentary of pa Patrick Swayze. I think that's streaming online. Uh, it, it, what's it called again? I am Patrick Swayze, right? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Make sure you check that out. Great, great documentary. Uh, died way too soon. Rest in peace, Patrick. Anyway, thank you everyone for joining us here on Cash Potato Theater, celebrating the 35th anniversary of Roadhouse. Until next time, we will see you on the